morning. Good morning. I'm Tom Daschle. I'm one of the members of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. To my left is Ken Weinstein, another member, and to my right is Dr. Uh, Asha George, the executive director of, uh, of our commission. Uh, we welcome all of you and are grateful to each of you for coming today. And let me pay a special thanks to uh, Colorado State. Uh, we're going to hear from a number of uh, leaders of Colorado State in just a moment. But we had the good fortune yesterday to spend uh, an entire day uh, walking through the facilities, getting a tour of the extraordinary uh, institution we have here with the passion of the leaders that work here. And it was just an inspirational uh, day, I have to say, from beginning to end. I, I thank each of those who made yesterday so productive, so informative, and so compelling. We hope to build on that experience yesterday with a a very important series of sessions today to talk more specifically about many of the issues that we face here at Colorado State and that uh, the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense has been working on now uh, for a number of years. So with that, I'd like to invite a couple of the members of the CSU community to make remarks. First, Ty Smith. Uh, Ty is the director of the Native American Cultural Center here at CSU and will read the land acknowledgement. Morning. Um, before I share the land acknowledgement, it is important to emphasize the relationship between land and people. Native peoples recognize that everything has a spirit. Plants, animals, insects, water, mountains. Native American identity is deeply tied to these, and they are referenced and respected in our culture, creation stories, healing ceremonies, and celebrations. Please keep this in mind as I share the land acknowledgement. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land-grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion, and significantly that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ty. Chancellor Tony Frank will now offer some opening thoughts about today's meeting, and as he comes to the podium, let me make a personal uh, point of, of privilege here in expressing my heartfelt gratitude to Tony for his warm welcome, the reception he and his entire team gave us yesterday, uh, start to finish. It was just extraordinary, ending with a wonderful dinner last <laughs> night. It's been a pleasure to get to know him over the last 24 hours, and, and uh, we're grateful with all of his uh, busy schedule that he could be with us this morning. Tony? Thank you, sir. Let me extend on behalf of Colorado State University my welcome to all of you and those who are uh, joining us by video as well. It's an honor for Colorado State University to host the commission in your work. I bring regards as well from Secretary Tom Vilsack, uh, who can't be with us today but will uh, be joining us via video presentation in a little while. Secretary Vilsack uh, works with us at the, at the new uh, National Western Center around issues of water as they relate to uh, food and the environment and human health. Thanks as well to Dr. Alan Rudolph, our Vice President for Research. You'll hear from Alan later, but Alan, you and your entire team have done a wonderful job in pulling this off. So to, to you all and to, to Carrie and all the others who work so hard at this, you have uh, my personal thanks. So I have um, a, a set of talking points that were given to me that um, are very well done. They, they talk about Colorado State University's long commitment to this area, the, the importance of the work, um, and, and why it matters to us. But 
My late father would have said that the rearview mirror is smaller than the windshield for a good reason. Um, and so rather than looking back at the things we have done over time that position us to be here, I want to change direction a little bit and look forward at some of the things that, that face us. I think the challenges that this commission deals with, the challenges that researchers in this field, whether at Colorado State University or, or any other university, the people in the private sector who work in this area, the people in government who have this as their concern, the challenges that face us are far too broad for our traditional approaches. They're too broad for any one university. They're too broad for a small consortium of institutions. They're too broad for one sector whether that's private sector, public sector, universities, government, to deal with. These challenges do not recognize national boundaries. They don't recognize the problems in communication across human-based organizations. And so we need to recognize that and to move our work across those same boundaries and to improve those communications and to be ready to respond in very different ways to challenges uh, a magnitude of which we have not seen as our world has become an, an increasingly small place. The work that's been done with a series of institutions um, in the series collaboration is a wonderful example of that. And to all those partner institutions, I want to say um, thank you to all of you as well. I think that, that for me, that example of a series of land-grant universities coming together to try and find ways to partner with the private sector and to partner with government sets an important tone that I think we can build on and that I think um, is applicable to the Commission's work. Senator Daschle and I had the opportunity last evening to talk a little bit about land-grant universities, something it, it turns out uh, we are both passionate about, uh, both being fans of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had a really interesting habit of signing legislation or executive orders that were phenomenally forward-looking and positive in the days immediately following a negative event on the Civil War battlefield. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order signed in the days following Antietam, still um, one of the bloodiest encounters in the history of the United States military. The Land-Grant Act was signed on July 2nd, the Morrill Act that created land-grant universities was signed on July 2nd, 1862, in the days immediately following the end of the Seven Days Battle. With the Union Army in retreat, the Confederate Army advancing uh, less than 100 miles from Washington, D.C., Lincoln, rather than packing, is at his desk signing legislation that will create a completely new network of universities dedicated to opportunity for everyone, everyone with the talent and the motivation to earn a degree and to make the most of that opportunity and sets that network up for a country that may well not exist if the war goes in a different direction. Whatever Lincoln's reason or motivation for looking so positively to the future in the days after a particularly negative or dark event, I don't believe that he could have imagined what he would see here today in these land-grant institutions. The scope of what these institutions do, the caliber of the research, the reach that they have, the very students that make them up, the, the world in which they live, in which we exist, I think would have been difficult for Lincoln to imagine. But I think in us and in the world, he would have recognized people coming together to foster new discoveries, new understandings, new ways of thinking about things, applying those for the benefit of the society that they were a part of and passing those things along to the next generation so that they could use it as a foundation on which to build. Every land-grant university, every university in the country tells its students at graduation that they are part of an important chain. At land-grants, we say that that chain extends unbroken back to the desk of President Abraham Lincoln. And we urge them because of the skills and the talents they have and the opportunity they've had to hone those skills and talents with their university education, to go out and use what they have and to live a life that makes a difference. And in doing so, to make our world a little bit safer and the future a little bit brighter. 
But that exhortation is not simply for our students on graduation day. Were that to be true, it would imply that our work and our time is over. And none of us here believe that to be the case, or we wouldn't be here. There is important work ahead of us. The work that the Commission does and will carry on today is critical to that same concept of making our world a little bit safer and our future a little bit brighter. So to all of you that are here today giving your talents and your skills, living lives that make a difference, thank you. And to the Commission, thank you for the work that you all do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor Frank. Uh, with your eloquence, you've set the tone perfectly for the entire day, and we're grateful. You mentioned uh, Governor Vilsack. He couldn't join us today, but as the Chancellor noted, uh, he will be with us in film later on today, and we'll show that this afternoon. This is the fourth meeting outside of Washington, D.C. Our first was nearly three years ago. And it touched on the topic we're here to discuss today, agro-defense. We're also nearing the fifth anniversary of the devastating outbreak of the highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, that impacted much of the American Midwest. Our government at all levels should actually be commended for acting as swiftly as they did at the time but that disease ultimately resulted in the loss of 50 million birds across 21 states. By the time the virus ceased to spread, it had caused $3.3 billion in economic damage. Such devastation is avoidable. That is why our 2017 Commission report defense of animal agriculture containing recommendations to address agricultural threats such as the ones this country faced in 2015 was proposed. I'm happy to say that few of our recommendations, including the establishment of a national animal disease preparedness and response program, eventually ended, in the, ended up in the most recent reauthorization of the Farm Bill. But as Chancellor Frank noted, there is much, much more work to be done. Later today, we'll be joined by CSU's own member of Congress, Representative Joe Neguse, who will provide the congressional perspective on this timely topic. I'm also looking forward to getting the perspective on the ground. Mr. Leachman, I look forward to discussing with you the implications of a biological attack for your business. Dr. Hardum, it'll be good to get your organization's perspective on where our diagnostics and response capabilities stand today. More than a century ago, Congress distributed land to educational institutions across the country to further our understanding of the number of issues, including agriculture. And as Chancellor Frank noted, these land-grant universities have become a staple of their communities. And our resource, the government should make more of an effort to work with to improve agro-defense. I very much look forward to discussing what more can be done as we pursue that vision. Dr. Mohapatra, thank you for attending our meeting on behalf of the University of California, Davis. And I would be remiss if I did not give an extra shout out to South Dakota State University, my alma mater. Dr. Christopher Hennings, we appreciate a jackrabbit coming from the Coyote State and participating today. It's nice to have a great face from a great place, our motto. And lastly, we look forward to hearing from another familiar face today, Dr. Rudolph, who previously spoke at a meeting we held in DC. And I must say on behalf of the, the commission, it's great to have him back. And we thank you in particular and to your staff for all the assistance you've provided us in making today possible. So I thank each of you for being here and for your participation. And with that, let me offer Commissioner Weinstein his chance to express uh, his thoughts as we begin. Ken? Okay, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Senator Daschle. I wanna start off first by um, 
remarking on your remarks, Chancellor Frank, uh, because they were so incredibly on point. Um, your themes of the challenge, the need for collaboration, the need for everybody from different disciplines, different backgrounds to link arms and, and try to tackle an overarching problem. That's exactly the theme that we need to get across today. In fact, that is the point of today. Asha, we could uh, just turn the microphone off and go home, and if we put into practice what you've said today, we've done our job. Asha won't allow me to do that, but um, it really is, uh, your point is, your comments are directly on target, and I think exactly what everybody across the nation, but in particularly in Washington, D.C., need to hear. Um, in terms of coming out here today, I want to thank you, thank everybody who's made this possible, who's invited us here. It's... Um, it gives me an opportunity to see my big sister, Ann Bond, who's in the, who lives out here and is in the audience, but also just gives me an opportunity to get out and get a perspective outside of D.C., and that's the sort of standard catchphrase that people use, but it's real, and it's very real in this situation. Um, we came out to K-State, what was that, three years ago, and uh, Senator Daschle and I presided over a meeting like this, and it was absolutely eye-opening for me, a kid from the city, from the D.C. suburbs, um, you know, we heard about agro-defense, we heard about the challenges that are faced out here in the, in the, um, the uh, agricultural community. Over lunch, we heard about the challenges of dealing with a, you know, a chickens after um, a pathogen's been detected and how difficult it is to eradicate 150,000 chickens. And as I sat there thinking about whether I really wanted to eat my chicken sandwich, I was hearing about what it takes to kill 150,000 chickens. I'd never thought about that. I'd never thought about sort of what the challenges are on the ground dealing with these kind of dangers. And it was incredibly eye-opening. Same kind of realizations yesterday as we got the tours, the seed bank through the, um, the various facilities out here, where as Senator Dashiell said, the passion about this, these issues, it was apparent in the face and the, and the voices of everybody we talked to, in the dedication that was apparent in, uh, in the work that's being done out here. Uh, once again, incredibly eye-opening and something that, it's a message I think that needs to be gotten across. Um, so in terms of today, I'm looking forward to hearing from all the, all the speakers. I think we have a number of different themes that you've heard from Dr. Frank and Senator Daschle, uh, but really the collaboration is the key here, and I think that collaboration, collaboration of the present and the collaboration of the future is seen in the list of people that we have, um, and I just want to say thanks to those folks who are gonna give the state level perspective that is you know, so important to this, Dr. Rohr, Colonel Hopkins, uh, the, the insights that we're gonna get from you, but then also the, the federal participants, Dr. Uh, Baravesh and Del Dr. Delgado. Uh, it'd be so important to understand the perspectives from every level. Uh, and then I think it is our job collectively and our job as a commission to take those different perspectives and do our best to then pull that together into a strategy going forward and hopefully get the rest of the country and get our, um, our, our public officials back in Washington, D.C. to do everything they can to enable that, that plan to become uh, realized in the future. So I look forward to hearing from everybody, and once again, thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Ken. So we will now move to our first panel, and we're very privileged to have uh, three very distinguished Representatives uh, Keith Rohr, the state veterinarian of the Colorado Department of Agriculture, Colonel Bray Hopkins of the U.S. Army, the director of Joint Plans, Operations, and Military Support, the Colorado National Guard, and Lee Leachman, the managing partner, Leachman Cattle Company of Colorado. Gentlemen, welcome. We're grateful to each of you for being here. And uh, Mr. Rohr, let's start with you. Thank you, commission members and others, for this invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts and perspectives on biodefense. In this response and recovery panel, we've been asked to describe the requirements for response to and recovery from agricultural crime, terrorism, and naturally occurring disease outbreaks with large-scale consequences. In background, I'll describe the livestock production systems, the risks of high consequence contagious animal diseases, and identify some of the needs in order to more appropriately and effectively respond to disease outbreaks in the future. Livestock producers 
in the United States are credited with production systems that yield an abundance of farm animals and food animal products. Our livestock producers have provided America and our international trading partners in export nations with the safest, most plentiful food supply systems in the world. This incredible food production system is built on a platform for purposes of efficiency in business operations and market access, and not necessarily for biodefense or disease prevention and response capabilities. Livestock and livestock products, including beef, pork, lamb, chicken, eggs, and milk, move across the United States on a 24-hour a day, seven day a week basis. One tank of diesel fuel and one semi-tractor trailer can transport 40 adult cattle, 500 head of weaned pigs, 5,000 chickens, or 7,000 gallons of milk across the United States. It's acknowledged at, one, at any time in Colorado as many as 50,000 head of cattle may be on wheels. And we're experiencing that, we call that fall run. Livestock producers tend to develop relationships and business inter interactions with peoples and companies that they have working relationships with and have had profitable business histories. These livestock commerce relationships have little to do with location or state boundaries. Because of the complexity of this food animal system, in the event of a highly contagious or transboundary disease, our livestock sector industries are not easily managed to prevent disease spread. Clearly, the introduction by natural or intentional means of a foreign animal or transboundary disease could be economically devastating. With foot and mouth disease, the disease impacts caused by production losses and hardships for farmers and ranchers could be devastating. It would also have a serious impact on livestock trade. A single detection of foot and mouth disease will likely stop international trade completely for a significant period of time. Since diseases can spread widely and rapidly, there are grave potentially grave economic consequences. Foot and mouth disease is one of the diseases livestock producers dread most. A more recent threat of a foreign animal disease that has potential to be devastating to U.S. swine producers is African swine fever. It is a serious disease found in countries around the world, most long-standing in sub-Saharan Africa. The disease has been spreading through the European Union, reaching 10 member states and affecting both domestic and wild pig populations. Since August of 2018, China has experienced thousands of cases of African swine fever. Scientists now report that as much as 25% of the world's swine population may perish in this present disease outbreak. There's no treatment for this disease. There's no vaccine available for this disease. The only way to stop this deadly disease is to depopulate all affected or exposed swine herds. As the number of cases grows, the USDA is increasing its vigilance and safeguarding efforts against the spread of this disease into the United States. In response to high consequence diseases in the US, it's been demonstrated that quarantines or movement restrictions lasting more than 14 days would interrupt the business continuity and could cause irreparable economic damage to, any, to many livestock sectors. So, what, would, what do we do, need to do from my perspective to prepare or respond more effectively to these disease threats? First, further planning and exercise in the USDA secure food supply system plans. Some of the secure food supply plans include those for milk, beef, pork, chicken, and eggs. 
maintaining the plans in their appropriate exercise integration into state and local health plans is needed and must be a continual cycle. All of our livestock production sectors need biosecurity and disease prevention strategies that can be ramped up and fully implemented into their animal business and product movement structures in the event of an index case of a highly contagious disease. Secondly, animal disease traceability. The ability to trace livestock in the event of disease outbreaks, both interstate and international, is exceedingly important. There's been significant prog progress in animal disease traceability in the last five years, but we still lack a comprehensive national system. The progress in the last few years has been primarily within state animal health officials' offices in officials' data and IT response systems. Also, advancement through voluntary producer marketing verification programs. All these traceability systems must merge into one comprehensive system to meet the production needs of producers and the disease response needs of state and federal animal health officials. We can't afford to wait and develop a national animal disease traceability system in the process of responding to a highly contagious multi-state disease event. Third, the continued advancement of the animal health laboratory diagnostic system. Livestock disease surveillance in the United States is accomplished daily when livestock producers report disease occurrences to private practicing veterinarians who submit test samples to laboratories in university veterinary diagnostic laboratories. The results of those disease tests, if on reportable lists, are forwarded to state or federal animal officials. This disease surveillance system in the United States is the best animal disease surveillance system in the world. The National Animal Health Laboratory Network system is vitally important as a capacity in disease response and needs appropriate funding to aid in response to disease outbreaks in the United States. The last tool needed is improved vaccine technologies. African swine fever vaccines have been stated to be at least five years out in the future. That may not be soon enough to protect pork production in the United States. It's been estimated that an adequate supply of foot and mouth disease vaccine for a level two of six outbreak may cost as much as $150 million per year. The Farm Bill funding is presently planned for a foot and mouth vaccine bank funding with $92 million over a five-year time period. This may not be fully adequate, but it's a far greater protection tool than we had previously. In conclusion, the roles played by land-grant universities and public-private partnerships in safeguarding the nation's needs are further disease exercise planning efforts, attaining a comprehensive animal disease traceability system, continued advancement of animal disease laboratory diagnostics, and improved vaccine technologies. All of these tools, all of these efforts are vitally important to protect the livestock production sectors in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rohr. Colonel Hopkins. Good morning, sir. Senator Daschle, Commissioner Weinstein, Dr. George, thank you for the opportunity to address the Commission this morning regarding response and recovery efforts in the advent and wake of a biological event affecting the food and agricultural sector. As a representative of the profession of arms, and specifically a member of the 54 State and Territory National Guards, also known as Guard Nation, our number one priority is defense of the homeland as prioritized in the National Defense Strategy. The National Guard plays a unique role as we maintain both a federal and state mission. 
The Guard may be federalized in support of overseas deployment or in the event of a major regional or national catastrophe or homeland defense mission within the continental United States. Typically, the Guard falls under state active duty status. In either domestic operations, state or federal, the Guard maintains the mission of saving lives, preventing suffering, and minimizing large-scale property damage. As a military force that's located in just about every community within the United States, the Guard is typically the first military responder to an event. It's important to understand that DOD forces and capabilities under U.S. construct and in compliance with the National Response Framework, the National Incident Management System, and the Incident Command System are always in support of civilian interagency partners. That stated, the military does bring significant assets and case capabilities to the fight. As a state-sourced military force, the overall Department of Defense chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and high-yield explosive, otherwise known as CBERNI, with an emphasis on the B for this discussion today. But the CBERNI response enterprise, known as the CRE, and once again, the Department of Defense of all entities is really good at putting an acronym within an acronym. We are solely comprised, or that, that CBERN response enterprise is solely comprised of guard personnel within the first 48 hours of response. CRE forces are located within each state and territory, and larger capabilities are located and stationed within each FEMA region. The description of assets and capabilities utilizes an all-hazards approach, not just focused on biological, but also the, the chemical, nuclear, and radiological as well. That is primarily based on the available time for National Guard soldiers and the various training requirements, including training for the wartime mission. A brief description of the phased response capability as it relates to the Seaburn threat follows. Within Guard Nation, the first to the scene is going to be a civil support team, or CST. There are 56 total civil support teams located throughout the nation and territories. Each state or territory has at least one team, with two teams being located in Florida and California, respectively. Each team has 22 full-time guardsmen, meaning they wear the uniform every day, uh, unlike your traditional guardsmen, which would typically be 48 days a year and then two weeks for annual training in the summer. And they have a response time of three hours, 24-7, 365. So within three hours of notification, they're out the door. The mission of the civil support team is to support incident commanders in the sampling, survey, and identification of seaburn substances, as well as potential modeling of the effects based on the threat. Each team has a command and control section, a fully inter interoperable communications suite, survey section, decontamination section, and medical section. These teams maintain significant interagency coordination at the state, local, federal, regional level and conduct exercises routinely along with biannual national recertification. What's interesting about the civil support team is unlike a lot of other Department of Defense response entities to a domestic response, the use of the civil support team is free of charge to the requesting entity. As a response would progressively increase, the next asset to deploy is the Seaburn Enhanced Response Force Package, or SURF-P, another acronym within an acronym. Only in the Department of Defense can we have that. Each of the FEMA regions maintain at least one SURF-P. Additionally, both Puerto Rico and Hawaii, due to their geographic location, maintain one each as well. FEMA Region 1, which is the Northeast United States, maintains two teams. FEMA Region 3, in vicinity of the National Capital Region, maintains two. FEMA Region 4, which is the southeastern United States and primarily based off the hurricane threat, maintains three. And FEMA Region 5, the Midwest, uh, with Chicago being the major metropolitan uh, entity in that region, has four. And in total, the National Guard mans and trains a total of 17 surf peas. Each surf P, as we ramp up that response to, in this case, a biological event, consists of roughly 203 traditional guardsmen, and they have the mission of deploying by ground or air within six hours of notification. The organization of the surf P also has command and control, interoperable communications. Uh, based off of the threat, they have a search and extraction division with fatality search and recovery, decontamination, and medical section. It is relevant to this discussion that they're manning 
also includes a biological medical engineer and a biomedical health technician uh, based off of the response. The final specific guard-related seaburn capability that we can bring to bear is the Homeland Response Force, or HERF. And there are 10 of those located nationally, uh, one in each FEMA region throughout the nation. You can see as this progressive response increases, we're now increasing to roughly 533 traditional guardsmen uh, that also have the mission of deploying at notification plus six hours by both air and ground uh, upon initial notification. HERF capabilities have a much larger command and control spectrum, primarily because they would be tasked with the command and control over multiple SERFs that would be coming in to respond to an event. They also maintain interoperable communications, which uh, if everyone remembers was pretty much a buzzword post Hurricane Katrina when uh, no one was able to talk to each other in the first responder community to include the Department of Defense. Uh, that has largely been taken care of now. They have an additional embedded SERP within them and the additional item they have is what's called a case or a Seaburn assistance support element which provides a significant security element to cordon off areas to allow first responders to do their job. On a national level, and within 48 hours of request, Guard Nation can bring to bear over 10,000 guardsmen to facilitate a response based on scope and geographic location. Based on the severity and scope of that incident, the next level capability response is provided by the active military component with some isolated reserve support in that as well. That primary force is the Defense Seaburn Response Force, or DSERF, and they also have a Cree Alpha and Bravo. Seaburn Response Element Alpha and Seaburn Response Element Bravo. That active force component brings many of the same capabilities that were provided in the initial, initial response by the National Guard, but it consists of a total of 11,200 active and reserve soldiers, and they maintain a 48-hour post-notification mobilization timeline. Cree Alpha and Cree Bravo, the next tier up, maintain a 96-hour post-mobilization timeline. Their capabilities, as with those of the National Guard, can be augmented by additional medical, aviation, transportation, or security assets based off of the needs of the incident commanders or the responding entity or requesting entity. In closing, the Department of Defense is fully committed to the defense of the homeland and as stated, the National Guard is a primary component of the domestic operations mission, whether the event is generated by natural or man-made forces. Each of the Guard assets and capabilities listed are not restricted to their home state, but may be utilized to support any event in the nation, utilizing either the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, if they're in state active duty, or through presidential declaration or federalization of a major event. Significant resources are applied to the overall general threat of seaburn related events and additional multipliers may be engaged based on interagency request. So, ma'am, sir, gentlemen, I thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Colonel Hopkins. I have a number of questions I'd like to pursue, uh, but before we get to questions of the panel, let me turn to Mr. Leachman. Thank you, Mr. Leachman, for being here this morning. Pleasure, pleasure to be here uh, representing uh, independent cattle producers from the state of Colorado. Obviously, as we um, sit back and think of the ramifications of this panel's discussion, it uh, strikes fear into our hearts as we think about the future of our industry and even the future of our communities as uh, the disruptiveness um, is uh, really incalculable. It's what, what it can, what can it, what the effects are. And I think really from our vantage point, as we look at the industry and we look at our state of preparedness as an industry and, and as a state and as a government, um, the, the key in my mind is that we find this balance between how we currently conduct business as an industry where we have great freedom and great means to seek efficiency and move animals and, and transact business um, versus um, a level of, of what I would see as, as regulatory oversight that would require us to do a much better job of managing the movement and, and, and uh, traceability of these animals. And our industry, I think, has had these discussions for a long, long time, perhaps without fully realizing the ramifications of these significant events and what they could do. And, and from my vantage point, as we think of our business and, and even our industry and the cattle production here in Colorado, 
um, the, the hundreds of thousands of animals that would be impacted, the, the tens of thousands of producers, and even in just a small region that would be impacted immediately, the urgency of a, of a quick response to that in a way to uh, be on top of this scenario um, almost immediately really comes to mind because I, I, as I see it, we're really in a sort of almost an existential situation for our industry. This type of an event in swine and poultry and perhaps some of the other um, protein production systems, we can recover from over time. We can repopulate those sectors. We have large businesses that can do that. When we switch into to cattle production, we're talking about family operations. We're talking about depopulating cow herds that would literally take decades to repopulate. And uh, it, it really raises the question of, of whether we would recover from that. Um, my guess is that, that our industry would be um, just a shadow of what it used to be. And, and I say that with some experience, having had the luxury of traveling abroad in South America and in Europe and seeing the ramifications of these events in those countries. And, and while they've now put things in place that uh, help them move forward, as I look at our industry today, I think we're woefully ill-prepared for this type of an event. And I think the uh, really the need today is for better communication to the industry to prepare ourselves to better understand the ramifications of these potential events and to really take advantage of the technology that exists today and put it into place to better prepare ourselves. As I see it, um, we, we have, as, 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 uh, as Keith mentioned, uh, a lot of people that are doing traceability now to supply um, better and safer food supplies, and particularly with beef. And so that's going on. I think it, as we look forward, it'd be great to figure out ways that we could incentivize greater participation in those voluntary systems such that when we do need to step in in one of these situations, we're ready. We're ready and we're prepared with the systems and the technologies and uh, the intergovernmental workings to, to respond quickly. I think that's really a key. Um, the decision tree's got to be very clear the, the response has to be very rapid, and uh, an industry has to have complete buy-in to that type of a response. I think particularly in our industry, as fragmented as it is, with over several hundred, what, 700,000 independent ranchers raising beef cattle around the United States, and then the way we move and aggregate and redisperse animals and carcasses, we're really at risk. And so this is an, an urgent concern for us. Um, it's a concern that we, we need to address, and uh, I think the technology gives us a, a place to, a starting point today to do that. I think if we were sitting in this same situation and asking these questions 15 years ago, we would be very helpless. <laughs> but fortunately today, we, we do have the ability to do that. And I think, um, finally, I think we have to uh, have it, the industry prepared um, to... Uh, to buy into complete compliance. I think that's one of the challenges in these situations. How do we control the movement of these animals and the movement of commerce and do so in a way that's not totally disruptive to these rural communities? I just sit back and think about if, if we can't move cattle to feedlots and uh, we, we're not prepared to feed corn, the disruption that that would have in the rural economies in our country, even if it was short-lived, um, would be just phenomenal. And uh, when we look back and, and look at what, what BSE did, it really, it took us 20 years to recover from that. And uh, it, it's really just, just now that we're starting to attain the same levels of export that we did pre-BSE. And so um, I, the, the, the ramifications are significant and uh, the industry's concerned. And I think it's time for the, the industry to adopt change. And I think I just uh, commend the, the, the commission for uh, trying to be in the front and leading this process, um, for we all know that if we come from a responsive standpoint afterwards, it's too late. We have to be prepared. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Leishman, for your eloquent comments. Let me start with some questions and I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Dr. Rohr, you recently uh, found yourself grappling with a small-scale outbreak of vesicular stomatitis a virus that uh, traditionally spreads among horses and cattle. Can you speak to Colorado's response to this disease and how the lessons learned from this and similar events can help inform the response to a larger scale event? Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Colorado is perhaps known as the fertile crescent for vesicular stomatitis. <laughs> we seem to have more cases than the rest of the nation combined. Uh, this outbreak is my fifth that I've experienced. Over what period of time? 24 years. The advancement through
through USDA and changing policy that's science-based, and then new tools of information technology have enabled us to manage a disease event while not with high mortality, there's still significant morbidity in, in disease, primarily among horses and some in cattle. The economic disruption of this, while hard to measure, uh, we used to ride horses up and down the road. Uh, now we pull them up and down the road. And there is an economic input in Colorado of $2.2 .2 billion per year in our equine industry. So business continuity and appropriate response in disease are exceedingly important. The collaboration of, of Colorado Department of Agriculture and USDA in response to this outbreak has tried to minimize that impact. We've changed and right-sized according to science movement restrictions and tried to maintain as much as is possible business continuity while effectively controlling disease outbreaks. What do we need? More science. We still don't fully understand this vector-borne disease. It's not very contagious. It's primarily spread through insect vectors. I think we can continue to work and hopefully in time uh, better and more effectively manage this pesky disease. How do you work with your human health counterparts to prevent human cases when a, when a virus has the potential to cross over? Fortunately, many of the diseases that we've traditionally worked with are zoonotic diseases. That was, I think we've said the statement, we were One Health before One Health was cool. Uh, <laughs> we worked feverishly for decades with USDA to minimize the economic impact of tuberculosis and brucellosis, two diseases that affect, still affect people today. So while our roots are in that, we understand that there are new and emerging diseases and other diseases that could have uh, a, an incredible impact on both. So our collaboration with our human health partners into a One Health effort in the future are exceedingly important. In Colorado, we have very good working relationships with our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and our local county people, so that when we manage rabies cases or Q fever or other communicable zoonotic diseases, we have personal working relationships with those people that are on the ground in human health, and we value those relationships very much. We, yesterday, we heard a lot about collaboration, and Commissioner Weinstein mentioned uh, how uh, important uh, uh, that concept has been as we look at One Health. Just on a, on a, on a regular basis, uh, organizationally, how does that coordination and that collaboration actually evidence itself? Do you have meetings on a, on a regular basis? Do you have ways with which you can communicate with one another and talk about these priorities? In the past, most of our collaboration has been event-driven, and there's always events. When we plan, we do plan together, and we had an opportunity uh, last year to incorporate our public health partners in a disease response event. While not a zoonotic disease, they got to see the incident command structure and the way that we would function in a highly contagious disease like foot and mouth disease. There's always a human health component anytime agriculture is impacted. And part of that is the, the mental health and stress component. People's livelihoods are at risk, and uh, most of those people have generations of history in farming and ranching, and protecting their livelihoods is exceedingly important. Fortunately, in our state, and I think most others, our human health people understand that. I'd like to take the whole question of collaboration across the panel and in the context that you each have come to articulate. And I, Colonel Hawkins, you, you talked uh, very, very uh, compellingly about the elaborate infrastructure that is in place in working uh, within the National Guard to, to accommodate uh, the anticipated challenges we face with regard to uh, events that, that uh, will require collaboration. Uh, I guess I, I'd like to drill down 
as it relates to Colorado itself. Is there such a thing as an agreement uh, that the National Guard would have with the state of Colorado with regard to how an event would actually be addressed and, and, and your role and how that collaboration actually takes place on the ground within this state? Yes, sir. Um, an actual agreement with individual uh, divisions or departments or um, local jurisdictions does not exist between the Colorado National Guard, and that's because we operate within that national incident man management system. So an event occurs, the request, if the local community could not, uh, or if they get quickly overwhelmed, will be, get reported through the regional field manager up to the State Emergency Operations Center, which eventually would generate an executive order from the governor, which authorizes the use of National Guard forces. Um, majority of the time, the, uh, the, the requesting agency is asking for a capability, and then we determine the asset that can provide that capability that would uh, be provided. Um, obviously, as I spoke, sir, I was talking about specific Suburney related right. uh, capabilities that we provide um, based off of the force structure or the types of units and capabilities within the state. That does differ in 54 different armies and air forces across the National Guard because not everyone maintains the same force structure. But we do maintain the capability uh, by Guard Bureau um, directive for 10 essential capabilities. And, and those, regardless, Seaburn's one of them but aviation, security, engineering, medical, command and control, communications, those all play into those capabilities that we can bring to support. Um, in, in my role as the Director of Plans, Operations, and Military Support and, uh, and the leadership within the Colorado National Guard is fully supportive of it, we, uh, we strive to exchange business cards uh, and what we say is left of bang, uh, meaning that we get out into the community I have a, uh, an interagency liaison whose full-time job is participating in exercises um, in tabletops, full-scale exercises, uh, even the meetings, to include a state-level Homeland Security Advisory Council uh, where all of the departments get together and talk through uh, issues such as, uh, as these we're facing here today. Um, I can tell you that in the short period of time that I've been involved with the Homeland Security Advisory Council, <clears throat> the actual bio threat has not been one of those that has been discussed, uh, but we do maintain uh, a, f a fairly rigorous exercise schedule where we bring in other interagency partners to ensure that we're collaborating and exchanging those business cards left at bank. We all know that once an event occurs, it can be a fairly chaotic situation and that's not when you need to be uh, shaking hands and, and learning who your counterpart's gonna be. So just to clarify that last point, you, you've had a number of exercises that have anticipated this, this collaboration, but as I understand your answer, there, is no, there, is no, there has been no specific training or exercise effort around an agricultural disaster so far. Is that, is that accurate? That's correct, sir. Uh, obviously the Seaburn elements spend a significant amount of time training on uh, not only chemical, radiological, nuclear, but the biological piece as well. Uh, but as far as the construct for uh, the foundation for an exercise of what we are orienting on, we have not focused on bio. Uh, a couple of those that skirt the edges and have been in some of the literature that y'all have published previously that we do regularly exercise is uh, receipt and delivery of the strategic national stockpile and the point of distribution because in Colorado's plans, the Colorado National Guard is heavily involved with that. That, once again though, if we're looking at the subject we're talking about today, did not have to do with a veterinary stockpile. It had to do with uh, human SNS, strategic national stockpile. Thank you. Mr. Leishman, you, you, you talked, uh, I thought, in a very compelling way about the importance of being prepared and the need for that collaboration between your association and your producers and, uh, and state and local entities. Could I drill down and ask more specifically, what, what in your view would be the ideal setting for a collaborative effort that would be far more prepared to deal with a, with a, a, a real disaster than what we have today? Where should we put our emphasis? I think one of the challenges is that the, uh, the states very much regulate the movement of these animals. 
And as, as we sit as a, as a producer, perhaps quite unaware of the full extent of coordination between the states, we could imagine just from our vantage point that there's a, a, perhaps a lack of coordination there that would get us into trouble because we have so many animals moving across so many state borders at the same time. How do we, how do we quickly um, manage that? What is the plan? And so it seems to me um, between these entities that, that particularly bringing into focus how the states would work under one of these disaster scenarios to regulate and control animal movement is critical. And uh, I, I, to me, that, that's probably my, from my vantage point, my personal vantage point, that's our biggest risk, is that we would not be able to move quickly enough because we are so segregated on a state-by-state -state basis in terms of how controls are put into place. And I think that uh, really it, it, it's, it's a, it seems to me a, a real point of leverage. We as an industry tend to fight kicking and screaming any time of kind of regulatory or, or uh, uh, even traceability initiatives. But at the, at the day that that becomes completely necessary, it has to be something that can be implemented immediately. And it seems to me that that's a leverage point that the industry could buy into, that we need to be prepared to do it at a, at, at a, really at a, at a at, in, in an urgency that we've never seen before, because it, again, it is existential for our industry, I think, at this point. We talk about One Health, and Dr. Rohr mentioned it uh, as well. Like, is there an equivalent to human emergency medical services when it comes to responding to plants and animals, Mr. Leachman? In, in your view, is that One Health concept uh, so, uh, so much an evidence that, that when you have disasters like this, you have the emergency infrastructure in place to deal with it? Um, that's, a, that's a great question, and, and obviously going to vary operation by operation. I suspect um, that, that, it's, that the answer is going to depend on the particular disease, because it's going to depend on how it, how it rolls out and what the ramifications are. As, as benign as, as vesicular stomatitis is, or at the other end of the spectrum, we could, we could envision some significant issues that would uh, you know, be like the swine issue is now. I, I think at the end of the day, um, we are producing food and everyone recognizes we're producing food and so we have to have that focus. And I think our, our, our focus and our ability to, um, our desire really to make that food as safe as we can and to mitigate these effects as quickly as we can really should lead us to solutions, to having solutions in place that will be more efficacious than what we have right now. Thank you all. Ken? Thanks to all of you for your very thoughtful comments. I want to follow up um, first with you, Mr. Mr. Rohr. You, um, you talked about traceability of infected animals um, and that the current efforts are just at the state level, uh, that we need to have a, a national you know, a plan for that at the national level. Do you, or any of you for that matter, do you have a, a model in mind as to how to take whatever the state efforts are and combine them into a national plan that would address the concern that Mr. Leachman had about, you know, the movement of animals across borders? And state perhaps wise. I clarified, there is a national system that has performance standards that each state has to adhere to. So we have to demonstrate to USDA that we have the capability to trace uh, certain animals of interest, and we've done that for years with program diseases, slow, chronic, uh, progressive diseases like brucellosis or tuberculosis. There, there is a national system today, it just needs to mature. Secretary Vilsack put together the traceability system that we have today, and the six pillars of that system enabled the states to move forward. I think this administration has a vision to go forward. It's in a pause right now. I think we're looking at new technologies together in a collaborative way to demonstrate can we use electronic ear tags, can we use databases to manage information in a real-time way for the purposes of business continuity. So what we understand is and states do need to be coordinated. I think we have the plans. There are the secure food supply plans. 
in the case of Mr. Leachman, uh, a secure beef supply so that states, our neighboring states and other states that we trade with can act in as similar as fashion as possible. But in the end, what we're trying to enable is we don't own the plans, the producer does. So the producer demonstrates the biosecurity. We use the National Animal Health Lab network system for testing, real-time testing, so that we can have a safe and secure movement of livestock in the face of disease. We can't rely on movement restrictions alone. That won't work. Mm -hmm. We just need a safe system to move. I think we have it. We just need to more fully integrate it into our livestock sectors. Uh, Mr. Leachman, you want to expand on that issue at all? Well, I think, I think the challenge today is, uh, is making that system as rigorous as we can. And as a producer who, who sits on the other side and utilizes the systems, um, you know, as with any system, there's leakage, right? There's leakage. And leakage in these disease outbreaks cause problems. And so how can we better incentivize producers to be ready to adopt um, a, a plan that would, that would minimize that leakage? I think that's the challenge to us today. Okay, you, you made... Um a point that I want to follow up on. You said that you need to make sure the independent cattle producers buy into full compliance. Is that what you're alluding to, buy into full compliance? Yeah, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, um, the day we have one of these outbreaks, we'll wish we had a national traceability system that was implemented. That, that, that's, that's, I, I don't think there's anybody on my side of the table who would say, if that happened, we wish we wouldn't have had a traceability right. system. <laughs> So, so we're in a very unenviable position where we're divided as an industry as to whether we want that today um, or we're, we're um, hesitant, um, we're looking at different technologies. There is an awful lot of adoption going on at the producer level of, of various technologies that, that are being tested in various ways to see their efficacy. I think we need to incentivize more of that and then, and then we need to ask the tough questions if this were to happen tomorrow, how would we address it? I think that's maybe where we're lacking because we don't, we haven't forced that consensus, at least in our industry. Okay. And you mentioned um, in your remarks that we're woefully unprepared for a catastrophic incident of the type we're talking about here. And you mentioned that, I guess, in your travels in South America and Europe, you'd studied the processes they put in place and the hard experiences they've had mm -hmm. with these kind of incidents. Any lessons to be drawn from what they put in place that maybe we should consider adopting here in the U.S.? Well, the first lesson is that, that these systems can be put into place, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's a finite number of animals, and they can be tracked. They can be identified. Mm -hmm. And the technology today works, and, and, and you can identify these animals and track where they go. And, and the, the, the more we do that, the better we do that, the better response we're going to have. And I think... Um, the, w when I go to those countries, y you're, you, of course, encounter people who, when, they, when these systems are implemented, they're highly skeptical, and they say, these systems aren't going to work, and why are we doing all this? And then as they're into the system for several years, they say, you know, this is really not so bad. We can do this, and we do this, and it works. And I think that's um, just a great lesson for us to see that, that we can accomplish it. We think of these rural environments and the, and the dis dispersion of animals and the dispersion of operations is really an impediment to making this happen. But the reality is that, that other countries with far less infrastructure and far less technology make it happen. And so we should be able to do it. That's an important lesson. It's, it's funny, just every time there's a crisis or an awareness of a potential crisis and you have a big challenge, sort of a process challenge ahead of you, the first reaction is, boy, that just can't be done. And then we saw, looking historically, like at 9-11, mm -hmm. how can we keep our airliners safe. It, it'd be impossible to put all those procedures in place. We did it. Yeah. It'd be impossible to, to dry up terrorist financing by putting regulations on banks to know your customers and that kind of thing. We did it. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're, you're right. That same attitude needs to be applied here. Mm -hmm. um, one question that and we and Alan were discussing earlier today about the financial impact on um, cattle producers, um, the insurance process I'm not asking about any particular insurance plan, but, you know, you've got a, I talked about the, the chickens, 150,000 chickens being killed. Mm -hmm. Probably only a small fraction of that number actually were infected. 
How does it work in terms of insurance? Can you insure your herd? Can you get, uh, for this kind of incident, can you get recovery for not only those that were actually infected, but those that got that were killed that, because of concern of further infection? It's, it's interesting. Um, rolling back in time, there was sort of a move to make these products available in the marketplace, these sort of catastrophic insurance mm -hmm. products. And uh, um, some actually business partners of ours were involved in that process. And the uptake from the industry was, was virtually nil, such that it, it made it very, um, you know, it was very hard to actually even have those systems in place. And they've sort of waned and waxed uh, because there wasn't enough demand from the industry. So I think, you know, it, it takes these type of avian flu and, 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 and the, the issue with the, the swine today that to really bring it front and center. And, and I think now people recognize that, you know, this could happen. This is not a hypothetical. This, this could happen. And so we need to be prepared for that. But I, don't, I think those products can be developed. I think they're out there, probably sitting on the shelf. But I would say in, in real terms, hardly anybody is utilizing them today. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Dr. George? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, first, uh, Colonel Hopkins, I wanted to uh, recognize a fellow paratrooper. Uh, I was an Army uh, All the way, airborne. <laughs> Um, so I'll, let me just stay with the National Guard for a second. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the role of the National Guard is certainly uh, much broader than uh, looking downwards into the state, although that's a primary responsibility. In addition, the National Guard can be activated and go elsewhere, elsewhere in the United States, elsewhere throughout the world. So in, in a particular situation in which the Colorado National Guard is called up in large part, let's say, to deploy to something like Desert Storm, which has you know, obviously happened in the past. What happens then if an incident of the type we're talking about now, or a CBRNE incident in general, occurs and much of or most of the National Guard is gone? What happens in that particular case? Would, would we call upon somebody else's National Guard? And would that communication occur you know, upwards through DOD, or would it occur, you know, governor to governor? Both. How would that be handled? Um, fantastic question, uh, and, it, and it goes back to Senator Daschle's uh, remarks on coordination and collaboration. So every March, the 54 get together for what we refer to as uh, all hazards coordination workshop, and, and that's the 54 within Guard Nation. Uh, our intent is to handle things at the lowest level first before we would escalate it to a national level. So uh, part of my job is the risk management and the mitigation of a scenario specifically of what you're talking about. Every month I am looking at um, force structure changes within the Colorado National Guard, meaning are we losing a unit, are we gaining a unit with additional capability, but more importantly, and which is usually what happens, is a major training event say um, uh, a combined training center rotation, which is federal certification for the warfight mission, or uh, an OCONUS exercise where we're sending forces outside the nation to participate in a combatant commander exercise in either Europe, CENTCOM, PACOM, wherever that might be. Um, but the one that has the longest impact is an actual deployment, mm -hmm. warfighting deployment in support of a combatant commander. Um, currently, as we speak right now, just to give you an example, one of the capabilities that in the, in the Colorado National Guard we use more than anything is rotary wing aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, 26 search and rescues this year, uh, just about every emergency operations plan that we are tied into heavily focuses on rotary wing aircraft. Uh, currently, all of my CH-47 Chinook units, which are the big helicopters with the two blades front and back, they're all deployed in support of the war fight in Afghanistan. So with that all hazards coordination workshop, I am actually first step coordinating with all of the other states within FEMA Region 8, and then there are a number of states that are adjacent to or border Colorado that are not in FEMA Region 8. Um, and and it's, it's basically a bargaining game. Hey, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna have helicopters for this period of time. Do you have this type of helicopter? How many can you provide? Um, and then they go on what we call a chiclet chart, which bases the tier of the event and who we are going to draw from within Guard Nation, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Now, I, it is not lost on me at all, and I maintain cl close coordination with my neighbors to the south, 
that Fort Corson, Colorado is located in, in this state. And they have an entire combat aviation brigade. Last year, they were deployed, couldn't rely on them. Um, but I do coordinate for that backfill, especially in an immediate response authority, um, if, if that is available to, to pull those helicopters into the fight as well. And then you, then you run into uh, the different in statuses, Title 10 U.S. Code versus Title 32 U.S. Code. Uh, we maintain, and we even exercised it a week ago, uh, the standing up of a dual status command, which basically elevates a National Guard general officer to be able to command both active duty forces and National, National Guard forces. Another important lesson learned from the Hurricane Katrina response. Okay, and um, for all of you, uh, if we have a suspected intentional incident, um, Colonel, would we, when would you be deploying, if you have them, CID to, to show up uh, on, on site? Um, if you have that suspicion that it looks like something intentional was done, um, Dr. Rohr, when would the state agriculture office say, you know, it's time for us to pick up the phone and call the FBI, uh, provided the FBI hasn't just run in on its own? Um, Mr. Leachman, same, same question. When, when would you decide to, uh, to make that call? Early in the investigation phase, if there's any doubt that there might be an intentional introduction and we have working relationships with FBI and the coordinator in Colorado for the weapons of mass destruction so that those people participate in our exercises and there's not many of them but enough that if there is some suspicion that it may be an, an intentionally introduced it becomes a crime scene and those are the people that we rely on to collect samples and do what they need to do early on in the response. Okay, sir. M militarily, um, and, and I stated in my comments, we are always in support of an interagency partner. Um, military never takes the lead. Mm -hmm. So as Dr. Rohr just mentioned, uh, in the case of uh, purposefully introduced pathogen in the, in the bio arena, the Federal Bureau of Investigation would be handling the, uh, the criminal aspects of that on, on U.S. soil. Um, the asset, and, and we use it daily, the civil support team, which was that first element capability that I, that I discussed, they conduct joint hazard assessment team um, missions with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, and the, the gentleman that, that he was referencing participates in their exercises right now on a weekly basis. Within the last week, we have conducted two joint hazard assessment team missions with the Federal Bureau of Investigation within Colorado. Okay, thank you. Mr. Leachman? I think at the producer level, you know, obviously we would go to our local veterinarian first and they would immediately go to Dr. Rohr's office, I would suspect, and so we would rely on that expertise and, and I would say that that connectivity and that response would be fairly rapid um, and that would be the case on most operations, I would assume. Okay. I just want to ask one final um, follow-up question. The senator asked about um, emergency response, um, but we were actually talking previously about EMS in particular. You know, we're used to it on the human side. You call 911 and in comes an ambulance. Uh, same on the military side. There's that that's the initial or immediate human response. Is there such thing as veterinary EMS? And if that is, is it the local veterinarian, or is it somebody coming in from the university? Uh, what is it? Who is it? It's all the same people that participate in the EMS on the human level. And we've had a lot of breakthroughs in Colorado in coordinating with our state emergency operations center, our regional emergency managers, county emergency managers, down to the local level. The veterinary health system is a little bit different. In the human system, federal at CDC to state departments of public health to county to city departments of public health. In veterinary medicine, we have the USDA. We have 50 state veterinarians across the country. But veterinarians are private practicing veterinarians. They don't work for us. But our working relationship that we have does form 
the best animal health surveillance structure in the world and our veterinary diagnostic labs that are part of that structure are invaluable. I think that's, I, I think having this meeting in Fort Collins where we have the CSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab that is a member of the National Animal Health Lab Network is appropriate. Let me thank each of you for your testimony, the comments, and, you, uh, uh, and, and uh, your good answers. We're very grateful to, to you. I think uh, as we consider response and the challenges we face at all levels, uh, uh, it's, it's really critical that we continue to work on preventative collaboration. And that's, uh, I think that will be something this commission will focus on for some time to come. But thank you all. Our second panel is going to focus on surveillance and detection. And uh, we have three experts uh, who will join us uh, for that discussion. Captain Casey Barton Baravesh, who is the, uh, the director of the One Health Office of the National Center of Emerging and Zoonic uh, Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention of uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Amy Delgado, the Director of Monitoring and Modeling of the Center for Epidemiology and Amer Animal Health and Animal Plant Health Inspection Services of the Department of Agriculture. And Dr. John Hardman, uh, I should say Hardham, uh, the Research Director of the Global Biologics Research and, of, and Chair of the Zetas uh, Center for Transboundary and Emergency Diseases. So we thank uh, each of you for being here. And, and Dr. Berevich, let's begin with you. Sure, thank you to the commission for inviting me. I'm honored to be here with my colleagues to start off the surveillance and detection panel. So we've been hearing the theme throughout the, the day that the health of people is connected to the health of animals, plants, and our shared environment. And with that close connection comes the risk of shared threats for our health, safety, and security. So that makes it incredibly important for us to collaborate. No single person, organization, or sector can address these shared health threats alone, and we really need to work together at the federal level, also with our key partners in industry, academic organizations, and non-governmental organizations as well. So One Health approach is a critical for addressing a number of issues. We've heard a little bit about zoonotic diseases today, those shared between animals and people, things like brucellosis, anthrax, zoonotic influenza viruses, and rabies. These diseases can affect people and also animals, whether it's livestock, wildlife, or companion animals. And there's some challenges where sometimes those animals appear perfectly healthy but can still be shedding germs that might make people sick or have an impact. Also, vector-borne diseases, those spread by mosquitoes, fleas, and ticks, things like West Nile virus, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and Lyme disease, emerging infectious diseases like Ebola and Zika, and then food safety and security concerns, things like Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and others. And then antimicrobial resistance is an important One Health issue that's relevant to our discussions on surveillance and detection. We know that if antibiotics lose their effectiveness, then we lose the ability to treat infections and control public health threats in both people and animals. And measuring that antimicrobial resistance in pathogens, whether it's isolated from people or food or animals, is central to our understanding and protecting health and security. So looking at zoonotic diseases, we know six in 10 known human infectious diseases can be zoonotic. Three in every four emerging infectious diseases have an animal origin, primarily wildlife, but again, livestock and pets can be a part of that. And then eight in 10 potential bioterrorist agents are zoonotic. So these are, are very important um, to consider in having strong systems for the prevention, detection, and response to, to these shared health threats. We know that a One Health approach is needed as it can help maximize our limited resources and help us achieve the goal of protecting health for people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. 
On the CDC side, we work to protect and improve health, safety, and security in the United States as well as around the world through the prevention and control of infectious diseases. And as part of these efforts, we provide leadership and technical assistance on a variety of different pathogens as well as One Health issues of public health importance. When new diseases emerge, our cause of an outbreak is unknown. Our state, local, territorial, and tribal partners and even foreign ministries will often call upon CDC for assistance because of our agency's broad expertise in these infectious disease threats. CDC has been a leader in One Health coordination. We were the first federal agency to establish a formal One Health office. We did so in 2009 and we're a decade old. USDA has a One Health coordinator point of contact and so does the Department of Interior and other agencies right now like the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency are working to ramp up their One Health coordination efforts as well. It's been hugely important for us as an agency to have a One Health office. We're responsible for the agency's domestic and global One Health efforts and we coordinate within our own agency, within U.S. government partners, with external partners, and with our global health partners as well. So one way we help with the coordination, communication, and collaboration around One Health is we have liaisons in place from different organizations housed at CDC headquarters in Atlanta. We have important liaisons from USDA, including the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and the Food Safety Inspection Service. We also have a liaison in place from the, the FDA as well. Um, we have a CDC liaison at FDA, and we actually have CDC liaisons at some of our global One Health partners at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and the World Organization for Animal Health that goes by their French acronym OIE. So we work together with these partners in protecting health for people, animals, and our shared environment using a One Health approach, and a big piece of that is surveillance. So one thing we've recognized is we all come from different sectors and we're all speaking different languages and we really wanna speak the same language whenever we're talking about our work across lines. We wanna to work together during non-emergencies and be prepared for when an emergency happens. It's always a challenge as we heard in the previous panel to figure out who to call during an emergency. Every second counts and we really wanna to, to have those formal coordination systems in place to help us be able to prevent, detect, and respond to threats more effectively and maximize our resources. So one thing I want to highlight in the United States is a few years ago we underwent a joint external evaluation. This is a voluntary process where a team of external assessors come from around the world and we work across all the different federal departments and agencies um, to assess 19 different technical areas. One of those includes zoonotic diseases. And the recommendations that came out of this JEE assessment are relevant to our discussion here. They recognize that we have a very informal One Health approach in our country currently and suggested that we formalize our national One Health coordination um, and take into account routine work as well as emergency response. They also recommended that we formalize interagency networks to address One Health issues through joint investigations, data sharing, and communications, and priority projects and diseases. Then they also recognize that we are short on dedicated public health veterinarians at the national, state, and local levels. We heard Dr. Rohr in the previous panel talking about the importance of his role as the state veterinarian for animal health, working with the state public health veterinarian. Only about 35 states currently have a designated state public health veterinarian, and this puts our front lines of public health at risk if we don't have someone there to help coordinate the One Health activities in the health departments. So one thing we did to, to work towards addressing some of these gaps and activities that we have ongoing, our CDC collaborated with USDA and the Department of Interior to host what we call a One Health Zoonotic Disease Prioritization Workshop. We brought together people from multiple departments and agencies 
with two main goals, to jointly prioritize our list of our top zoonotic diseases of greatest national concern for One Health collaboration in the United States, and also to develop some next steps and action plans to address those priority zoonoses while strengthening One Health. So some key things that I want to highlight from that, we have eight priority zoonotic diseases for our country, zoonotic influenza viruses, salmonella, West Nile virus, plague, emerging coronaviruses, things like Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus and SARS, rabies, brucellosis, and Lyme disease. And then we've started to discuss and make plans to create a formal One Health coordination mechanism for the federal government that would incorporate a leadership as well as technical level activities across all the relevant departments and agencies also have begun drafting a national One Health framework for the federal government to help guide our collaborations, clearly delineate roles and responsibilities, and surveillance is a big po a portion of that. Um, we recognize that our surveillance systems are largely separate from one another, and there's a lot of activities going on that we'll, we'll hear more about from our colleagues at USDA on streamlining surveillance for animal health and are in discussions with them on better linking that to, to human health. We've also created a One Health Federal Interagency Network, which helps bring together representatives from the key federal agencies relevant to One Health to work together on a regular basis and exchange information, um, and a number of other initiatives that we have outlined in our, in our full report on our One Health Zoonotic Disease Prioritization Workshop. So while we have made some progress in the United States, especially over the last decade, we definitely have a lot of work ahead of us in terms of formalizing our One Health coordination and making sure we can work more effectively across the government, work more effectively with our partners, whether it's through public-private partnerships with industry, working with academic institutions, training the current workforce as well as the, the future workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miravesh. Appreciate your, your comments. Dr. Delgado. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm with the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service of USDA, um, and certainly APHIS responds to many new introductions of pathogens that may affect agriculture to eradicate, suppress, um, or contain them through various programs in collaboration with Would you mind bringing the microphone just a little bit closer to you? Sure. Thank you. Is that a little better? That's better. All right. I can speak up as well. Um, I think it's important that, uh, to note at the beginning within APHIS, you know, we really do believe that surveillance is something that you do with uh, a population, with partners. Um, it's not something you do to someone or to a population. Um, and so all of our work is done in a, in a very collaborative way when we talk about surveillance. Um, effective surveillance, particularly for animal diseases um, or monitoring of diseases in animal populations, requires a lot more than just a diagnostic test or a tool. Um, these activities rely on a solid understanding of the population at risk, the distribution of risk factors within that population, the field performance of a diagnostic strategy, and the effective integration and evaluation of the data resulting from that surveillance or monitoring effort. On the other hand, efficient surveillance, um, which could be cost efficient or resource efficient, um, or monitoring, requires a great deal of information um, about all of those different criteria, as well as an understanding of how they might be changing over time. And so that information has to feed into a loop of education, enactment, um, and evaluation for any surveillance or monitoring system. Longer term domestic programs, such as bovine tuberculosis or brucellosis, have well established surveillance plans which link to specific actions for disease control. Um, and when we think about uh, emergency response for high consequence diseases like we're talking about today, um, those can be a lot more flexible uh, and, and adapted to the specific situation in which those diseases occur. Um, APHIS's monitoring of disease pathogens also occurs at multiple levels, and so I'll touch on um, different aspects of surveillance and monitoring. Um, as was already mentioned earlier, APHIS is currently in the rulemaking process for the National List of Reportable Animal Diseases. Um, which will replace the National Animal Health Reporting System, or NARS. Um, in ORAD, the national list, will facilitate regular and routine reporting of foreign animal diseases, high consequence endemic diseases, program diseases, and emerging diseases. 
In the meantime, the National Animal Health Reporting System serves as a voluntary platform for collecting state-level information on disease occurrence across the U.S. <coughs> a similar system exists on the plant side, the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program, which carries out surveys for high-risk pests through a network of cooperators in the program. In addition to these efforts, the National Animal Health Monitoring System works to collect and provide national level data on animal health management and production practices, as well as more detailed information on key animal health pathogens occurring in the U.S. These studies are conducted in collaboration with state and industry partners, as well as researchers from academia. Recent studies have provided information on a multitude of diseases like uh, bovine viral diarrhea virus, um, enthalmic resistance and internal parasites, mycoplasma ovid pneumonia, Q fever, a zoonotic pathogen, and antimicrobial resistance and select enteric pathogens such as E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. So while there's a great deal of, of surveillance uh, and monitoring efforts that take place prior to a disease event, including threat scanning and trying to understand diseases as they occur globally that may pose a risk to the, to the United States, um, a lot of those things have to shift when a disease is detected. Specifically, when we think about who is impacted by a disease event, um, such as foot and mouth disease or African swine fever, um, the, the producers who experience the disease come first to mind, those who are infected. However, there are a lot of producers who don't have the disease who are also impacted by movement restrictions, as we've already heard from today, surveillance requirements, um, other concerns, uh, and, and inability to conduct business as usual. And so I, I think it's important to point out the value of the negative test um, in our surveillance systems. And so when we think about the role of surveillance in a response, certainly identifying where the infected animals are is really important. But making sure we can quickly um, and, and rapidly identify where the disease isn't is just as important because that's what allows for us to maintain business continuity in the face of a disease event. Um, and minimize the impacts to those producers who don't have the disease to let them get back to business. Um, those sorts of rapid, frequent negative tests are not always available. However, we do have some programs in place on the poultry side where we have seen them be very successful in recent outbreaks, um, including the National Poultry Improvement Program, which conducts routine surveillance within U.S. poultry flocks. Um, and that surveillance can be leveraged during a disease event in order to support an understanding of where disease is in what populations and to quickly make um, control decisions uh, in support of rapid containment of the disease. Um, I do want to speak just a little bit about the role of surveillance during an actual response. Um, I think that it's uh, easy to say, well, there has to be a lot of surveillance that happens, um, and it certainly is true, but the surveillance has to have specific goals, and those goals need to be met through the design of that surveillance approach. Um, early on, there are specific things that need to happen in order to understand where the disease is, as I mentioned, and where it's not. Um, and then surveillance really has to shift to understanding how do we control the disease? Um, how do we permit the right kinds of movements, um, whether those are products or animals? And surveillance has a key role to play in making those decisions. Um, at the end of the day, a state best has to sign a permit and say, yes, um, I agree for this movement to happen. And they have to feel confident in the risk assessment underlying that decision. And surveillance is an important piece of that. And as we've already heard, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network um, has to have the capabilities and the capacity to support that level of surveillance to make those permitting decisions um, in as real time as possible to support business continuity. Um, in an ideal world, surveillance would tell you how much virus or pathogen is being produced, the stage of infection um, in that herd or flock, and then where that virus came from, for example, if it's a virus. Um, giving you this sort of solid intel on a positive negative status, uh, the risk and the source, um, all of which can lead to better prioritization of your response activities. In some cases, I think we have achieved this in recent outbreaks uh, where we've been able to integrate epidemiologic information and phylogenetic information to better understand disease transmission in populations, but we have a long way to go for other diseases. Um, but I think if we want to make strategic decisions during emergency response based on surveillance information, those are the types of uh, information that need to be flowing and need to be integrated quickly um, and shared quickly during a response. Um, as the response progresses, surveillance begins to shift toward how do we understand where we're at in eradication. Um, eliminating the pathogen from the population um, becomes the primary goal. 
And for many diseases, this may still rely on depopulation and disposal of infected animals. However, it may also involve controlled marketing of animals that have recovered from infection and are safe from moving forward to their intended purpose. And so as we've made advances in understanding um, disease transmission within flocks, for example, of low path avian influenza, we're able to look at alternatives to depopulation um, that allow those flocks to reach their intended purpose. Um, eradication is also dependent on our ability to detect pathogens in carcasses, in on-farm environments, and disposal areas. Surveillance of aerosols and leachate, as well as documenting inactivation of pathogens in field settings will continue to be an important part of our emergency response activities. We have a long way to go in understanding everything that we need to be doing in <coughs> surveillance and having the tools available to achieve those goals. Lastly, surveillance plays a role in resuming business as usual. Um, releasing farms from quarantine requires a robust surveillance strategy to improve disease freedom on that farm and in the surrounding areas that put that farm at risk. Environmental risk should also be assessed before you put naive animals back into a setting. Um, we have a lot of work to do on environmental sampling. We've made great strides for several avian diseases, but there's more work to be done for other pathogens of interest. Um, and then certainly herd level surveillance and biosecurity has to be a part of restocking. Um, not only do you not want to bring in the pathogen that you were combating, but you don't want to bring in other pathogens either. And so maintaining uh, herds and flocks that are healthy, um, free from disease, should be a goal at the end of any disease control effort um, to leave producers back in a, in a great position to continue providing safe um, and effective food. We've certainly made a lot of gains um, and a lot of strides in surveillance in recent outbreaks. We've learned a lot of lessons, but I think there's still some challenges that remain. Uh, certainly in the areas of data integration um, and visualization, how do we share across state partners, federal partners, um, to qu quickly give access to information um, at the right level that's useful for decision making um, remains a challenge that we continue to work on with every outbreak response. Confidentiality is another area in which we really struggle. How do we assure producers um, that their data is kept confidential and secure? Um, even while the need is to share and to coordinate across multiple uh, groups, industry, uh, academia, lots of different settings. And then making sure that we have the epidemiologic information to put surveillance results into context. A, a test result in and of itself without epidemiologic information is not very meaningful. And so we've got to have systems that capture epidemiologic information as well as integrating those with test results. So I think those are some of the biggest challenges we face. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you, Dr. Duvado. Appreciate very much your, your insights. Dr. Hardum. And I do have uh, prepared slides. Uh, so first, thank you to the commission for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I am the director for the Zoetis Center for Transboundary and Emerging Diseases. Uh, as a animal health company, we provide biologics, pharmaceuticals, biopharmaceuticals, diagnostics, and genetics to global markets. Uh, our Center for Transboundary and Emerging Diseases is a coordinating hub within our company. Uh, we coordinate efforts targeting transboundary and emerging diseases from our research and development organization, our global manufacturing and supply group, as well as our international and U.S.-based operations down to the field level. So why would an animal health company be interested in transboundary and emerging diseases? Uh, both the direct and indirect impacts of transboundary and emerging diseases uh, challenge the health and well-being of animals, uh, production, wildlife, and domestic. Uh, and they can be especially impactful in economically challenged regions without the uh, resiliency uh, to sustain a response to transboundary and emerging diseases resulting in protein shortfalls, social unrest, and regional instability. Uh, some of the indirect impacts uh, on the economics and quality of life consequences that we heard from our last panel affect the livelihoods of our important customer bases. Uh, and from a livestock perspective, those important customers for an animal health industry represent the small, medium, and large producers that we are entrusted to help protect their livelihoods. Uh, in addition, as we've also heard uh, from our panel members today, 
transboundary and emerging diseases can also have significant One Health impacts, and we as an animal health industry view uh, mitigating those One Health impacts as a social responsibility. So the agricultural threats uh, from foreign animal diseases uh, take many forms. Uh, we've talked about a number of them today, uh, most notably, of course, FMD and ASF. Uh, however, there are some significant other ones that are, have not been named, such as classical swine fever, uh, which is found mostly in Asia right now and significantly impacting uh, Japan. Uh, lumpy skin uh, disease, Rift Valley fever, amongst others. Uh, these threats, as you can see in the image here, can come from any number of regions through multiple avenues of approach to the United States or North America uh, from both natural and intended origins. So we have a lot of threats to keep an eye on. Uh, they can have significant economic impacts, as we heard from the first panel, uh, in the hundreds of billions of dollars of damage uh, that may take uh, decades to rebuild from, uh, and as well as the broad One Health impacts. From a biodefense perspective, the animal health industry does play a key component uh, as we can provide the tools necessary uh, for the response and recovery and surveillance and detection efforts. Uh, but we do view our part as part of a layered approach. Uh, from basic research on agricultural disease agents, this helps uh, from an animal health perspective uh, identify the targets for diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics that we take many years to develop. Uh, so early understanding of the agents helps us to help you. Uh, medical intelligence and threat assessments helps us understand the disease, the, the way the disease is likely to spread and where it's likely to go to and what routes of entry we may need to deal with. Uh, and then from the layered surveillance at multiple different areas, now, each one of those that I've identified there has different product profile needs. Uh, a diagnostic at a port of entry may be very different from a pen side test. Uh, and those different product profiles, it's very helpful for us to know what is needed ahead of time so that we can develop that product over many years to meet those needs. And for an animal health industry, surveillance and detection is really used as a tool to inform us on our investments in research and development. Uh, and also where we uh, register products. Uh, as the Countering Biological Threats uh, documents indicate, the best way to prevent a disease from entering the United States or North America is to mitigate the impacts it's having globally to reduce the risk of incursion. Uh, so we rely very heavily on global surveillance and detection to inform us on what diseases are most likely to impact our key customers. Uh, both private and government. Uh, and one aspect of that medical countermeasure development uh, for vaccines and therapeutics is having a regional-based production. Uh, we are a global company. We have manufacturing sites throughout the globe. Uh, however, with the high consequence uh, pathogens, that does create somewhat of a challenge as you need specialized manufacturing facilities for many of these countermeasures. And we do lack that capability in the United States currently. Uh, having a rapid response capability uh, would be inherent, as you heard uh, from our USDA colleagues, to the ability to respond and mitigate the impacts of a foreign animal disease incursion. Now, one other aspect to that uh, is the USDA funding to incentivize both academia and industry in research and development. Uh, whereas on our human health uh, side, uh, through BARDA and Department of Defense, uh, there's large degrees of funding that is for the most part lacking in the veterinary field. Uh, and lastly, uh, the government and industry coordination. Uh, we've heard a lot about the different governmental coordination efforts. Uh, I'd like to remind the commission and uh, the government agencies represented here that the animal health industry should also be a key component of that coordination. Uh, and I mentioned that gap in infrastructure. Uh, this slide kind of graphically shows 
the medical countermeasure development pipeline. Uh, as you can see on the bottom from the human side, uh, the Health and Human Services and DOD have robust infrastructure in place uh, from that early research through the early development pilot scale uh, at the various facilities that are shown there. And then advanced development and manufacturing, uh, we now have three uh, HHS Centers for Innovation, Advanced Development and Manufacturing, and one uh, Department of Defense, Advanced Development and Manufacturing Capability. On the veterinary side, uh, very appreciative of the large investment that the U.S. government has made in moving from Plum Island to NBAF uh, in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, that will give significant increase in the ability to conduct research on these transboundary and emerging disease agents. Uh, that facility also has a biodevelopment module for small pilot scale, but we still have a significant gap after that. There's nowhere to transition these high consequence medical countermeasures to on the veterinary side. Uh, and that is a significant gap that reduces our ability to respond and mitigate an impact of a foreign animal disease incursion. Uh, so, in conclusion, the three suggested action items that I have is one, uh, establish an agriculture advanced development and manufacturing capability for high consequence vaccines in North America. Uh, this would provide an, a location where we could do that advanced development and manufacture for these high consequence vaccines. Uh, and one question that frequently comes up with regard to that is, well, there's significant and robust manufacturing in the veterinary field already in existence in the United States. Why do we have a gap? Well, the presence of those high consequence uh, vaccine strains, such as FMD, African swine fever, the live attenuated viruses, et cetera, in our manufacturing spaces creates a significant risk to our other inline products. And by that, I mean when we move one of those agents into a manufacturing facilities, we have to uh, put that on what's called our blueprints and legends so that any country importing product knows what else we make there. If we were to put, say, an FMD strain at one of our manufacturing facilities, it would likely result in foreign countries not importing any product made at that facility. And that can put at risk billions of dollars of product. Uh, second item would be that collaboration with the animal health industry leadership, and that would be both for vaccine producers, diagnostic producers, and other industry consortia, uh, such as the animal health uh, industry. That level of collaboration within the U.S. government, within the Department of Defense, uh, I feel would benefit from also engaging with the animal health leadership. Uh, and lastly is the funding for research and development uh, for veterinary countermeasures. Uh, this is part of an offset of a uh, opportunity risk. Uh, when we invest in a medical countermeasure development program, uh, it is an opportunity cost for us, uh, as it would represent, say, a small market uh, with a significantly large investment to develop. So having uh, funded research at both academic and industry levels would help offset that and create a more positive return on investment. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hardham, for that uh, that presentation. We appreciate it very much. Could you keep up that last slide for a minute? I'd I'd really like to to just start with with that. I, uh, Dr. Bervish and Dr. Delgado, how, what what would you how would you respond to these? specific recommendations, especially the gap. It just, it seems to me that that would make a lot of sense, but I, I'd love to get your take on, and obviously you may not be authorized to speak specifically to a particular public policy question such as this, but what would be your personal reaction to that recommendation? Dr. Burbesh? So from the One Health perspective, it would be important to have conversations between government, industry, and other relevant partners on that exact issue um, to talk about who might be able to, to do what potential opportunities for collaboration and have those important conversations with the, with the One Health audience. Yeah, I think... Um, 
I think it's an important recommendation. Uh, we've certainly seen advances in, in countermeasure development um, that have died on the vine, so to speak, um, and, and not made it into uh, an item that's available um, to, to the U.S. or to other countries that struggle with that disease. And so um, I, I do think it's an important conversation to have and discuss as we move forward um, how, to, how to bridge the gap for some products that, that are needed in terms of countermeasures. Capability, uh, as Dr. Hardham has, has proposed, uh, may require obviously some policy, policy uh, uh, developmental uh, considerations that uh, that uh, I think are, are 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 should receive a higher priority. But I'm I'm surprised that his second recommendation, meeting with leadership of the animal health industry, if it really is a one health mentality that that isn't already happening. But obviously, if that's his second recommendation, there must be, there must be a, a concern about the degree to which that collaboration and coordination is actually occurring today. That doesn't take a change in policy. How, how, how is it that, that we are not doing more with regard to meeting with the leadership themselves? So from the CDC perspective, we frequently meet and interact with leaders of the animal health industry. We attend meetings like the U.S. Animal Health Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the National Institutes of Animal Agriculture um, to be able to have those important conversations. We also host visits from industry to come to CDC headquarters and spend a day talking about key issues. For example, we recently just had the National Pork Board, swine veterinarians, pork producers, and others come to CDC where we spent the day talking about areas of collaboration around influenza, food safety, and antimicrobial resistance. Um, so those conversations are happening. Um, more of those conversations could be, could be happening with, with more partners. Dr. Delgado, any, any reaction? Yeah, I, I think we would be on very much the same page in terms of the types of groups that we meet with. Um, I think we certainly have just finished uh, the U.S. Animal Health Association meetings uh, last week, which is an opportunity for industry, for academia, um, and for federal partners to come together and discuss key animal health issues, policy concerns, um, and, and identify ways to work together uh, to move forward. So there are venues and forums for that to happen. I think um, in some places we have also taken a more direct engagement with some of our um, uh, countermeasure production partners. Um, so specifically thinking about um, preparedness, you know, having conversations about the ability to scale up production of uh, reagents for biologic, um, you know, tests um, and those sorts of uh, products and doing sharing information, so doing disease spread modeling simulations to say, okay, this is what we think we would need in terms of capacity of certain reagents, for example, and then talking to our industry partners to say, could you provide that? What would that look like? How could you plan for that? And, and really to have a more meaningful engagement um, that allows all of us to be more prepared uh, in the event of an outbreak. So I think there's some good work happening in that space, but there's certainly um, more to be done. Dr. Artem, could you, you've heard the, the responses to, uh, I mean, in a sense, I think the answer is, well, we're already doing that, but we probably could do more. Could you drill down a little bit more on what you specifically mean when you talk about meeting more effectively with vaccine producers and diagnostic producers and the industry consortium? Yeah, so the, the suggested action item there is really to continue those efforts and enhance them even further, uh, both at the technical level, uh, as was mentioned, with the production of reagents and such and medical countermeasures, uh, exercising uh, for when we say have a medical countermeasure that's in the uh, National Veterinary Stockpile, how to deliver that when needed, uh, but also and somewhat more importantly moving forward with the development of the response plans, uh, being a partner in the development of those response plans moving forward and how can we fit in to help emphasize and uh, make them much more efficient in terms of the medical countermeasure delivery component. And we'll have to come to some agreement, correct. Could I just uh, ask more of a basic question of Dr. Delgado and Dr. Baravesh? Where on the universe of 
priorities does this actually lie? Uh, One Health, surveillance detection. Uh, to be honest, I have to say, I, 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 I get the sense that this isn't a top priority in CDC or in the Department of Agriculture today. I, 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 I may be wrong. I, I, I don't see it elevated to where it needs to be, and I, I worry about what it would take for us to, to, to make it more of an elevated priority. But uh, am I wrong? I mean, tell me, I'm, uh, clarify that for me. Where, where does this lie in the priority agenda today? From the CDC perspective, One Health has increased in priority level, especially across the center where I work, our National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, also within a few other areas across CDC. There are definitely a number of One Health issues we're tackling across our agency, um, not just the infectious disease and antimicrobial resistance, but mental health, the opioid epidemic, and others that are very relevant to One Health and having those One Health conversations. So I hope to see continued momentum and movement on One Health as a priority. Dr. Gatto? You know, I think from the USDA perspective, um, thinking specifically of that One Health emphasis on surveillance, um, it does get sometimes lost a little in the weeds of dealing with animal disease issues. And so we've heard a lot about the African swine fever concerns and, and the impact that that disease is having globally. Um, and that's not a, a One Health conversation that's um, easy to have. There are certainly One Health impacts of any disease outbreak and, and the responders and the producers and everyone who's impacted by a disease. Um, but we, with particularly within veterinary services, tend to focus very heavily on preparedness and response um, for the those diseases of concern. Um, and we engage our partners. We, we want to find ways to, um, to bring them in and, and have them uh, help um, and engage meaningfully in everything that we're doing and, and similarly when they have need of us. Um, but I, I do think that, that the veterinary space has always recognized that One Health was important, that the diseases that we work on impact humans um, and, and the environment and all those things are linked and integrated. Um, I'm not sure we're as vocal about calling it a One Health approach um, mm -hmm. as, as some other groups are. It's, it's our bread and butter um, and what we do. But it's certainly important, and I think it's an area that we need to continue to emphasize, and we're seeing emerging um, threats and concerns in that space um, that are going to require a more well-thought-out approach to dealing with things like antimicrobial resistance. And so um, I think there's, there's work to be done there. And in that context, to what extent does training and the resources required for training and, and the development of strategic plans to address disasters of all kinds uh, work its way through state, local, and tribal governments? Do you work closely and do you find ways that, that, uh, that, that you can engage governmental levels that, uh, uh, for these kinds of priorities? Absolutely. From the CDC perspective, we work very closely with local, state, tribal, and territorial governments. We have our epidemiology and laboratory capacity cooperative agreement where CDC provides funding to all 50 states and actually 64 jurisdictions in total to help with the foundation of their public health infrastructure as one important activity in collaborating and supporting the states on shared priorities and issues related to infectious diseases. Yeah, I think in the agriculture space, um, we certainly rely on all of our partners down to the local level um, for preparedness. And we've conducted a number of exercises and training activities in recent years, preparing for foot and mouth disease um, with the armor exercise, um, most recently with a large scale, full, um, full scale ASF exercise that involved many layers um, and levels of people uh, involved in agriculture. So I think there are opportunities. Um, we're excited about the Farm Bill of Funding um, and recently have put out a call for um, RFP for projects related to uh, training and exercise um, at state and local levels um, and made funding available for, for people to apply and, and continue that work, um, which we think is really important. Thank you. Kim? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the excellent discussion. Um, Dr. Hardim, I just wanted to follow up that chart you had that showed the gap. You know, you had the comparison of the uh, 
So there are three stages for human and veterinary, and you've got you know comparable efforts through research in the pilot stage, and then advanced development. You've got a gap where in the human side we actually have um, we have things uh, underway. In, in sort of laying out or diagnosing the reasons for that gap, you cited a, a couple things. One, um, <laughs> that manufacturers, if they undertake this kind of production, it might deter foreign uh, customers from buying. So, you know, it's a financial hit that they would take. Um, uh, and you also talked about the fact that, you know, I guess, metal cool countermeasures, they, they're sort of a one-hit thing, and they might not be sufficiently um, rewarding as a revenue matter. Um, and so, therefore, might not, on their own, the manufacturers might not want to gravitate to that kind of production. So, really, if you look at those two um, as root causes of this gap, it's a dollar and cents issue. Um, and, um, and I'm just not familiar enough with the history of this. Have there been efforts to try to deal with that dollar and cents issue on the veterinary side of, in the same way that we've had on the, the human side? Uh, the challenge is very similar to what we've faced on the human side mm -hmm. for, for many, many years. There's uh, four C atoms, the three with HHS and the one with DOD. Uh, there were efforts ongoing for decades before that to try and bridge that gap. Uh, it was colloquially known as the Valley of Death, uh, where you'd have products that were developed, brought up to IND phase, but since there wasn't an established market for them, uh, U.S.-based producers were reluctant to do the advanced development uh, and manufacture because of the limited market and return on investment was negative. Uh, with H1N1 outbreak in 2009, uh, that spawned the medical countermeasure initiative, which resulted in the establishment of those four entities uh, to bridge that gap. Uh, we have that similar and parallel issue with the veterinary space. Uh, for the most part, that gap has been met uh, with overseas production uh, in endemic areas. Uh, but with the threats from FMD, African swine fever, you know, classical swine, lumpy skin, etc., we have a need for that North American-based manufacturer uh, that's more relevant today than it has been in any previous time. Uh, so that gap is becoming more and more important. Uh, Establishing a agricultural ADM similar to those on the human side uh, would help the animal health industry as a whole to help produce those medical countermeasures that can help in uh, dealing with foreign animal disease incursion. So it sounds like, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to require federal dollars probably if you're going to try to fill that gap. Yeah. Um, From as the, it, like the last entry on your last chart there sort of offset the opportunity costs. And short of that, you're probably not going to get the manufacturers to go all in on medical countermeasure production. Yeah. From a producer standpoint, uh, in terms of medical countermeasures, uh, it is a negative return on investment if we were to construct a, a manufacturing plant for just one product with a very limited market uh, that may or may not be needed, depending on if there's an incursion or not. Uh, so financially speaking, that creates a very big challenge for us as an industry. Uh, having a, a public-private partnership uh, where any animal health partner could produce those medical countermeasures at uh, would benefit, I think, not only the industry, but the, the government and the producers. Okay, thanks. Um, shifting to a different topic, uh, Dr. Bervish, I wanted to follow up with you. You spoke about um, a number of initiatives, and it was very encouraging, a number of initiatives at the federal level, and I'm focusing on the federal level right now, recognizing that this is a sort of a multi-level um, challenge. And I think you mentioned that you have the One Health Prioritization Workshop, the One Health Framework, which I guess is in, in the drafting stage right now, One Health Interagency Network, and um, all of which sound like very promising developments. So one of the things that we've been wrestling with here is, uh, and I think one of the main sort of mandates for this commission is to try to um, generate ideas for how to coordinate all the different players. And we talk about collaboration here, but this issue, like the cyber issue, um, a number of issues that we're facing these days as a society, just requires so many actors of different types, and I think one of you mentioned speaking different languages and different backgrounds to coordinate together. And on the federal level, 
it sounds like you've got a number of coordination mechanisms. One question that we've been wrestling with is those coordination mechanisms are only going to be effective if there's a leadership, if there's some person, some entity that has the ability to say, okay, you agency X, you need to pony up the resources for the common good. Um, you agency Y, you need to take a back seat to agency X. That's a tough thing to do. Um, and sort of having looked at this issue as it arises in all different contexts of national security, law enforcement, and the like, uh, or policy in general, um, all these initiatives sound great, but do you have the feeling that there's a recognition of the need to have that driving leadership that can, can force different entities to work sort of together and sometimes to subordinate their own parochial interests to the broader interests of the mission? So there are a number of federal agencies and departments that are very relevant to One Health. Many are highly engaged, others are becoming more engaged, and some are not engaged. And it's important to have the highest levels of leadership within all of those departments and agencies understand the, the relevance of One Health, what their agency's roles and responsibilities are, and how to work effectively across all of the, the different sectors so we can maximize our resources and outcomes. One of the, the things we've been talking about within the, the draft of our national One Health framework is our first goal is formalizing a One Health coordination mechanism for the federal government. And that would give us a formal structure that would always be in place. It wouldn't be based on um, you know, trusted relationships and having things fall apart when someone changes jobs or positions or moves to a different agency. It would be a formal structure in place that would allow for leadership level coordination and input at the more senior executive level within agencies and departments, as well as kind of a core leadership group that's coordinating all of that. And then being able to have technical working groups, whether maybe it's for the different priority zoonotic diseases, or maybe there's something on improving surveillance and information sharing using a One Health approach and creating a technical working group for that and having it all coordinate and feed in to, to all the relevant departments, agencies at the leadership level and the technical level is a, a goal we're hoping to work toward. So that, that leadership coordinating group, to whom would that group report? There would be, um, the idea is that there would be uh, more of a executive council or group of leaders from the different agencies and departments that would be involved in helping to guide the work of the, um, the leadership group as well as the technical working groups, but the leadership group would be responsible for all the coordination and um, all of the, the organizing and collaborating that's needed. Okay, and would they report into the White House for interagency guidance and, you know, the extent that there's leadership that needs is needed to drive action is that how it will work sort um, of like you have on the national security council domestic policy council this kind of thing right that is something that we've discussed and the national security council seems to be a reasonable place where where that type of coordination would go through good okay It'd be interesting to see how yeah. that progresses thank you yeah. um dr delgado i wanted to add, follow up with you about your um you know, you talked about how the surveillance system is structured, and um, obviously a surveillance system is only going to be as good and as effective as the reporting it receives. And I'm not terribly familiar with this, but um, I guess the question would be, what obligation is there on behalf of somebody who, you know, has a herd of cattle uh, or a producer or a veterinarian or anybody to report when they suspect a particular pathogen um, is there an obligation, legal, regulatory, otherwise, that compels that kind of reporting? Yes, so there are uh, obligations, um, and they exist at different levels, and so there are certainly state um, list of reportable diseases, state requirements for disease reporting. Um, typically, it would be the diagnosis of a disease. Um, in some states, that's required to be reporting. In others, it could be the suspicion of a disease that's required to be reported. Um, the national list of reportable animal diseases is meant to kind of fill that gap um, and standardize the requirements for what diseases are reported and um, at what frequency and to whom. Um, but currently, that exists 
either through the voluntary National Animal Health Reporting System, which collects information on a monthly basis from all of our states, um, or at, at the state level that has specific requirements for disease reporting. Um, and it, I guess my question to you is, is that a concern? Is that an issue about, uh, is an issue to make sure that we get all the reports that, that we should get? And I'm, I'm sort of drawing an analogy, I know on the cyber side, you know, one of the issues that we've dealt with over the last couple of decades is companies actually have a business interest at times not to report that they've been hacked into, right? And what you want is a company that detects a, um, a penetration, they then let uh, you know, whoever it is in the federal government know uh, that, hey, we, we got this penetration, here's the signature, here's the information, that information then gets distributed so that everybody else in industry can then protect against that particular signature. That all makes sense, but sometimes there's a business interest in not admitting that you've been hacked into. So by analogy, I guess my question is, is there or can there be a built-in disincentive to reporting um, because of you know, what, that, what that might bring down on a producer that you know, has to then deal with um, the, uh, the outbreak? Or is, um, you know, and if there is a disincentive, I should say, is, you know, is there room for maybe having a national standard or something that makes sure that that, is a, that obligation is adhered to so that you're getting full reporting so you can have the effective surveillance mechanism you need? Sure. Well, I, I think we certainly believe that it's important to have um, that national requirement for reporting of particular diseases, and that's why we're pushing forward with the NLRAD rule. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of value to having that standardized information, how it flows and gets collated across the United States. Um, I think in the current uh, system, we've seen successes and we've seen failures um, in disease reporting, uh, being timely and actionable in different ways. Um, but I think there is a lot of people in the agriculture industry who um, certainly want to protect their industries. Um, and there are a lot of diseases that you can't hide. Um, once they're in, and so it, it usually comes out, um, <laughs> but but is that is that quick enough, um, and is it transparent enough? And so you know, I think by having a standardized, um, this is the list. Those are the requirements, and who you report to will be really beneficial to us. Um, I think we're going to continue to engage with education and outreach with our laboratory partners to ensure um, that if they're seeing things, if they're getting samples um, that are being tested for diseases of concern, that that information is rising to a level um, where action might be needed. And so I, I think, you know, we're working with the system that we have now, but we're certainly committed to um, seeing the value and moving forward with NLRAD. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Hardim, um, you may have heard recently that there have been some real difficulties with some of our ADMs on the human side. Um, in particular, the sale of uh, ADMs that have been funded by the federal government to foreign countries is um, at the very least a uh, slap in the face and at the very worst, uh, you know, a national security issue. Um, so here you are now recommending or, uh, an ADM for the agriculture side. Uh, I don't know how much traction we're going to get with that right now, considering the other stuff that's happening. So if you couldn't have an ADM, uh, how else would you fill that gap? How else do you think that gap could be filled? Uh, with regards to production of medical countermeasures for the high consequence uh, pathogens, uh, there's likely two ways that we could move forward still with the absence of uh, public-private partnership for an agriculture ADM. Uh, one would be relying on overseas production, uh, where we would be able to produce these medical countermeasures in regions where they're already endemic. Uh, that, of course, does have significant negative impacts to the ability to protect and defend North America, as you're relying on overseas production. Uh, the products produced there, you know, they're their primary market would be the, the region that they're in. Uh, and North America would then come second. We learned that one from H1N1, uh, which was the impetus for these human health agriculture, or human health ADMs. Uh, the second would be construction of facilities specifically by an individual uh, animal health company. Um, 
those, because of that negative return on investment, would likely be much smaller uh, with significantly less capacity uh, and may only partially or minimally meet the needs for any foreign animal disease incursion into the United States. Okay. Thank you. You know, it's just it's just uh, an interesting situation we find ourselves in now in terms of timing and uh, what's happening up uh, up in Congress. Um, Dr. Baravesh, um, I too have a doctorate in public health, and I have to tell you one of the irritating things about the One Health paradigm is that it sounds awfully lot like uh, or awfully much like the public health paradigm. Uh, when I was in school, we were told it's it's composed of environmental health and regular human health and agricultural health and every other kind of health there was. I used to draw an umbrella of everything. Um, so uh, what do you think has been the value of introducing this new this new title for something that has existed for you know centuries uh, before the name came up? has existed for centuries and it's always been a part of CDC's work since we first stood up in 1947. I know USDA would say the same as Dr. Delgado said it's their bread and butter, but I think the, the value of calling it something and getting increasing attention on it is we, we've heard through some of the discussions about some of the challenges with recognition of different partners, whether it's a federal agency or industry or others, as to what their roles and responsibilities are. And I frequently see when people are talking about, in general, multi-sectoral collaboration or working across sectors, um, that animal health and environmental health are frequently left out of those discussions. So I feel that by calling it One Health, it really brings attention to those three key partners, human health, animal health, and environmental health, but it's also to mention all the other relevant partners depending on what the exact issue is. There'll be a core group of people involved on, on every issue, but if we're talking about zoonotic diseases, there'll be some additional partners versus if we're talking about the opioid epidemic, there might be a different set of partners. And how would you say things are going uh, inside the CDC in terms of um, One Health coordination with you know, the National Center for Environmental Health and the others there? Yeah, so CDC is made up of a number of different centers. And since I've been the director of the One Health office in about the last four years, we've had some sort of collaboration or interaction with almost every single center um, that our agency has, though we work most frequently within my home center, Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, with our Immunization and Respiratory Diseases Center that houses work on influenza, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, and our Center for Global Health on some of our global One Health efforts. But we've worked with environmental health, chronic diseases, obesity, and others um, on a variety of One Health issues. All right, and Dr. Delgado, you know, one of the things we, and I apologize to my CSU colleagues because I've been harping about this. One of the things our commission has been focused on is the uh, BioWatch system uh, in the United States and the National Biosurveillance Integration Center, uh, which is, uh, both of which are run out of the Department of Homeland Security. And in the absence of those two programs really functioning particularly well, it bothers me that, that what that means then is that the default is going back to um, just regular old ordinary you know, surveillance that, that we usually conduct and uh, relying on human beings and animals and plants for that matter as sentinels for, um, for disease. Um, but when you look at it from an investment standpoint or a funding standpoint, we have huge amounts of funding going over here to federal, you know, detection surveillance systems, um, and not as much, at least at, at least not as much of that going back the other direction, um, further down uh, at the state and local level, and so forth. Um, what are what are your thoughts about this, and how do you think we can strengthen those systems? Uh, probably through, in all honesty, when we're talking about agriculture, through USDA. Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, I think um, INBIC, uh, so where I'm at, the Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health, we've had a, an INBIC liaison for several years um, that's stayed engaged with that group and in, in sharing information. 
um, and really trying to add some context around agricultural pathogens um, and disease events. And um, I do think it's been a valuable interaction from that perspective. You know, there are things that um, they would come and, and get really worked up about something and you say, well, actually, that's, that's not a big deal, and here's why. Um, and <laughs> this was the population that was affected. This is where that disease normally occurs. And, and it really was a useful dialogue to sort of um, keep things in perspective and, and share some really valuable information. Um, I think it could be strengthened. You know, I think that there are a lot of constraints about how that information flows and who has access to it um, that can limit its usefulness. Um, at the lower levels of, of our partnerships. Um, and certainly there's security requirements around it. And so when you start thinking about your state and local partners, you know, most of them would, wouldn't have the, the clearance to take advantage of some of that information. Um, I think the, the BioWatch system is, is not something that I have been very involved with or engaged with. Um, I think we've seen dangers of false alarms um, in the agricultural space. You know, we want to make sure that a positive is a positive before we impact our international trade um, and, and movement of products. And so, you know, I think as that moves forward and they think about the pathogens of interest um, that that system might target or how they change the sensitivity and specificity of that system, um, I think those are important considerations to think about, you know, and even from the agricultural perspective, uh, we would want to be really confident in, in a system that makes sure that we um, know that a positive is positive um, and that we have the systems in place to investigate rapidly and, and assess what a disease situation might be off of a, an environmental type sample. Um, so I think there would be some concerns, at least in my mind, um, about you know expanding BioWatch into a, a lot of our agricultural pathogens. Um, but I think they could be they could be addressed. I, I think it's the question of is that the most valuable investment of resources in, in a surveillance strategy? Is it the most targeted and efficient? Do we know enough about the risk in our populations and where those diseases might occur to really target those types of systems? Or should we be spending that money maybe at that lower level of better understanding risk um, and better targeting our surveillance efforts through, through that type of information? Thanks. Well, this has been an excellent discussion and I thank each of the panelists for your thoughtful presentations and the very helpful answers you've given to all of our questions. We're very grateful to you and appreciate very much the work you each are doing. We're going to take a about a half hour break now for lunch. As I understand it, food will be served here. Patricia, do you want to give the instructions? Very good. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome to Fort Collins, Colorado. I hope you've had a good morning session and I want to welcome the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on Biodefense and specifically uh, Senator Tom Daschle, a good friend and a great patriot, uh, as well as uh, Kenneth Weinstein, uh, who used to work for the Homeland Security Department. This is a really important topic and I appreciate the fact that there are so many of you in the room today concerned about defending American agriculture. Here's why this is important. This is an industry, the food and agriculture industry of the United States, that directly or indirectly employs 43 million Americans, according to Dunn Associates' recent study. That's 28% of the American workforce. This is an industry that impacts and affects 20% of the American economy. So anything that damages the food and agriculture industry can have devastating effects on farm income, on jobs, and on the American economy. So it makes sense that we spend some time and some resources thinking about how we can do it better in defending American agriculture. Now, it has to defend itself from Mother Nature, from negligent activities of people, and from intentional acts by those who want to harm us. So a good deal of work and time and effort and money is being spent today in food processing facilities around the country to guard against food safety issues arising from people not doing their job. And there's some time and attention being paid now to uh, homeland security and the threat of agriterrorism. But I think there needs to be an equal amount of time and effort focused on Im the impact that Mother Nature can have on our American agricultural system and on the food system because it can have a devastating effect. This requires, in my view, a partnership, a strong partnership between government, land-grant universities like Colorado State University and the private sector working with the farm community to provide a system that allows us to avoid problems through appropriate training and proper procedures, that allows us to detect a problem as quickly as possible and to be able to identify the source of the problem, to be able to react and respond appropriately and then to remediate. But let me tell you why I think this is important. As the Secretary of Agriculture in 2014, I was at my desk uh, when some folks came into the office to tell me that there was a suspected high path avian influenza epidemic that could strike our poultry and turkey system. I didn't quite understand at the time the, the magnitude of what turned out to be a, a, an incredible crisis. You see, what happened was that we had an incredibly warm winter which allowed ducks and geese that in the Midwest Flyway to spend more time than they would normally spend on lakes and rivers and streams and around farms in Iowa and Minnesota. As a result, they created and developed a high path avian influenza trait that we had not seen before. And as a result, commercial operations in both of those states were impacted and affected. Over the course of just a couple of months, we saw 50 million birds having to be depopulated because of high path avian influenza. We saw nations around the world prevent us from being able to export our, our eggs, our poultry, and our turkey because of avian influenza. Even today, there are countries that ban sales from certain parts of the United States because of uh, avian influenza. The impact was dramatic. We lost over a billion dollars of exports, impacting thousands of jobs. We had a situation where the United States government was required to put out $800 million in remediation efforts. We closed down facilities and farms for literally months. So this was an incredibly difficult circumstance. And we learned a lot as a result of this experience. This was the worst crisis we had ever seen in the poultry industry. Consumers were impacted as well because the amount of eggs that we had available was significantly reduced. So even regular Americans were impacted by this at the grocery store. We learned a lot of lessons from the situation involving avian influenza and now as we see globally uh, the concerns of the African swine fever in China and the impact it's having on the pork industry I think it behooves uh, the Blue Ribbon Study Panel to look at this thing from a 
comprehensive approach. Uh, let me make a couple of recommendations, if I might. First of all, I think it's really important for the government to work in partnership with land-grant universities, and I think it's important for land-grant universities to work together in a collaborative way. So I'm pleased that in the, the room today are representatives from the Series Coalition, which is a series of land-grant universities who understand the importance of working together, understand the importance of collaborating on this issue, and understand that by collaborating we can get to the best policies, the best standards, the best protocols, the best research, uh, the best lab uh, facilities. So I think it's important for the government to recognize the power and the impact of land-grant universities in partnership with the food and agriculture industry and the, and the farmers and farm organizations of this country. So what, what does this partnership need to do? Well, first, I think it needs to make sure that there are sufficient training materials available so that farm organizations can work with Extension to get the word out about how best to prevent situations from like this from occurring. The better equipped, the better trained, the better prepared we are to prevent, obviously, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, the reality is we will be better off. It will also allow us to more easily and more earlier detect a problem that may arise. And I think once again this partnership has a responsibility of getting information out into the countryside through extension, through land-grant universities, through farm associations and organizations so that people are in a position to be able to see early enough that a problem is occurring and to be able to report it to the appropriate officials, to be able to have an immediate response. Now, land-grant universities are the great partner with the federal government to work together to create the lab facilities, to make the investments in lab facilities that will allow us to identify as quickly as possible what may be happening on the farm or may be happening in a grocery store or may be happening in a food processing facility that impacts and affects our food system. By being able to detect early, we'll be able to identify how we might be able to create a vaccine that could respond to the crisis. And then be able, with the government's help and assistance, and again, using land-grant university facilities, to be able to stockpile appropriate levels of vaccines, appropriate amounts of vaccines, to be able to respond to perhaps the most serious consequences that we know may be out there, from foot and mouth disease to African swine fever. Being able to stockpile vaccines could be incredibly important in being able to contain a crisis and to be able to minimize the impact of it. We need land-grant universities, the government, to work with local government officials so that if there is the need for a quarantine, local law enforcement officials know precisely how to do it, what risks may be run and how they do it, to be able to properly train their people to be able to do it well so that the quarantine is successful and tight. At the same time, those same local government officials need to also work in advance to know where a disposal site might be appropriate if they have a catastrophic event. Being able to identify that landfill, that location in advance will ensure that uh, animals, crops and so forth can be disposed of quickly, thereby reducing the risk of further contamination. It's important, I think, for protocols and standards to be set forth, for information to be provided to land-grant operators so they don't feel like they are threatening the community. A better awareness is incredibly important, and there's no better vehicle for doing that, no trusted more trusted vehicle than land-grant university and extension. I think it's important and necessary for us to have tools in place so that if we do get impacted and affected by a crisis that we're able to respond appropriately so that our farmers are not economically devastated, so that jobs that are lost and impacted as a result of the crisis, that workers are not devastated as well. So I think it's important for the, the Blue Ribbon Study Panel to look at the impact on workers and farmers if a crisis hits. This strong partnership, I think, is critically important to minimizing the risk, to preventing it, and for minimizing the consequences of it. That's why this particular panel discussions that you're having over the course of this day in Fort Collins are just incredibly important and why it's so, so important and why we should be so grateful to the Blue Ribbon Study Panel for taking the time to come out and listen uh, to what we have to say about this very important issue. Because again, I'll remind you, this impacts potentially up to 43 million employed Americans and 20% of our economy. You can just see the impact of the avian influenza on farm income. 
In our country, you can see the impact of African swine fever on the Chinese economy and on income. It can be devastating. This needs attention, this needs investment, and this needs a strong partnership. And I'm pretty certain that the Ceres Coalition is prepared to be a strong partner with government. I'm pretty certain that local government officials would appreciate being able to provide, be provided the information to allow their people to be trained. And I'm pretty sure communities will appreciate the fact that this has all been pre-planned so that responses can be immediate and the crisis can be contained. It's a really important business. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that I've had the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you uh, during the lunch hour uh, to express uh, my thoughts about this. And I hope and look forward to the recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Study Panel uh, and hopefully that they reflect the need for a strong partnership between the United States government and local government, our land-grant university system, and our food and agriculture industry. Thank you and I hope the rest of the day goes well. The program will resume at 1 p.m.
So you know, I'm leaving at 125. Yeah, I know. Okay. You got a big trip ahead of Sorry you. Sorry about so that. No, that's perfectly all right. It's so good to do this. If you wouldn't mind, why don't you just mention that so that they understand what I'm uh, That's a good idea. Ken's going to be ducking out. That's a great idea. I know him well. Yeah, we worked together on a lot of things and did many things politically together. And he invited me to come to Iowa on a few occasions to speak on things. And uh, But my daughter worked for him when he was Secretary oh, really? of Agriculture. So we have that connection as well. What, in what capacity? Uh, she worked for him on his personal staff oh, in, the, in, the, in the department there. Yeah. yeah. I don't have much exposure to him, but I've always been impressed with him. And he's, he's such a he's good guy. very good here. Yeah. Nice. He's a wonderful guy. I think this is going well. Things went very well. Press, interesting. Yeah, yeah they were actually all over it. Yeah, yeah. I Courtney, so how do you Courtney? So I mean, they were actually. Should we start? Genuinely interesting. Let me uh, welcome everyone back. Hope you had a good lunch. There are a few notes uh, before we get started. The first, having to do with Secretary Vilsack's excellent presentation. He referred on a number of occasions to the Blue Ribbon Study Panel, which was our original name. And it only changed within the last uh, two months, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so his presentation was filmed prior to the time the actual change in name took place. And so that, that uh, may have caused some confusion, but we are the one and the, one and the same. We used to be the bipartisan uh, Blue Ribbon Study Panel, and uh, now we're the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Uh, second, let me just say I uh, have really appreciated Commissioner Weinstein, uh, Weinstein uh, joining us in what has been an incredibly busy schedule. He has to leave for London shortly, and we'll be connecting uh, in Denver to, uh, to get to London yet uh, today. So uh, when he leaves, it will be... Uh, only because he has other obligations. So we uh, again reiterate our gratitude to Ken for coming and uh, for his participation. Third, uh, there are not as many as there were this morning, but there were a number of students here uh, throughout the morning. And just for the record, let me just say, even if they're not present at the moment, uh, how much we appreciated the fact that they were here and could be returning. Uh, they are the future. And uh, we are grateful for their interest, their commitment, and, uh, and their willingness to be engaged in this discussion. So for that, too, we're very, very grateful. So we'll begin our next panel. We have, uh, uh, we've been very, very fortunate to have uh, three distinguished experts, uh, uh, Prasant Mahatprat. Prata uh, is the Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of California in Davis. Uh, Alan Rudolph, who we've come to know well over the last 24 hours and has just been remarkably uh, receptive and responsive and his warm hospitality has meant a lot to, to all of us. The Vice President for Research at, here at Colorado State. And Jane Christopher, uh, Christopher Hennings, uh, the Head of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences uh, uh, for the uh, South Dakota Animal Disease and Research Diagnostic Laboratory in my alma mater at South Dakota State University. And we thank Jane for coming all this way and being with us this afternoon. So uh, let me start with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mohama Patra, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to participate in this discussion, and uh, it is certainly my pleasure. In the last decade, outbreaks of agricultural pathogens have resulted in devastating losses to the agricultural industry. 
Safeguarding the nation's agriculture from biological threats is a very critical issue, and land-grant universities, such as UC Davis, play an active role in this arena through their advanced research efforts. And as Vice Chancellor of Research, I take uh, this part of my responsibility very seriously. I will highlight a subset of our activities related to the broad areas of agro-defense. PREDICT, which is a project of USAID Emerging Pandemic Threats Program, was initiated at UC Davis to strengthen global capacity for detection and discovery of viruses with pandemic potential that can move between animals and people. PREDICT has made significant contributions to strengthening global surveillance and laboratory diagnostic capabilities for new and known viruses. Working with partners of over 30 countries, PREDICT is continuing to build platforms for viral surveillance um, and for identifying and monitoring zoonotic pathogens or those that can be shared between animals and people. Using the One Health approach, the project is investigating the behaviors, practices, and ecological and biological factors driving disease emergence, transmission, and spread. Through these efforts, PREDICT is improving global disease recognition and beginning to develop strategies and policy recommendations to minimize pandemic risk. A recently funded grant, PREEMPT, PREEMPT with two E's, Preventing Emerging Pathogenic Threats, we are good at making acronyms even when the alphabets are not there in the world. <laughs> um, um, PREEMPT is a DARPA-funded program that seeks to improve medical preparedness, bolster the fight against emerging infectious disease, and preserve the health of U.S. troops and communities around the world by containing high-risk zoonotic pathogens at their animal source. This project seeks to change the paradigm regarding addressing potential pandemics from reactive to proactive and creating a new model that uses scientific surveillance and international cooperation. I can talk a uh, lot more about preempt, but um, uh, let me move on to the other aspects of our efforts. Um, very recently, a team of senior faculties and scientists from UC Davis, Colorado State University, Tuskegee University and five other universities and national labs formed a consortium called SEALD, Solutions Through Highly Integrated Engineering and Life Science for Defense. The vision of SEALD is to establish innovative science-based and engineering-driven technology for the rapid on-demand detection, production, and assessment of medical, veterinary, and agricultural biological countermeasures. SHIELD plans to engage diverse stakeholders in government, academia, industry, and our communities are partners in the technology development and uses of technology. This transdisciplinary team aimed to tactically increase the nation's capacity to respond to biological threats uh, to agriculture and to the nation's food supply. Their proposed study, in cooperation with state and federal authorities responsible for leading the incident response, will increase capacity through analysis of limitations in the current countermeasures. Um, the Animal Science Department at UC Davis is home to the USAID-funded Feed the Future Innovation Lab for genomics to improve uh, poultry. This program is identifying genetic markers genes and signaling pathways that are associated with enhanced resistance to Newcastle disease in chickens. Newcastle disease virus is a highly transmissible pathogen that has major importance to our trade, economy, and national food supply. This program is de developing an innovative genetic selection platform that will enable farmers to selectively breed chickens with enhanced resistance to this high-consequence exotic disease. Other specific examples of our research efforts uh, include the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory System, um, are known as uh, COPS. COPS provide quality services that protect animal health and performance, public health, and the food supply. It is the backbone of California's warning system that helps to protect the health of California's livestock and poultry. COPS serves the people of California by safeguarding uh, public health with rapid and reliable diagnosis. It operates in partnership with California Department of Food and Agriculture, 
um, UC Davis, of course, uh, veterinarians and livestock and poultry producers. It is one of the original 12 pilot laboratories that were chosen by the National Animal Health Laboratory Network and designed to mail federal and state resources for rapid responses for uh, intentional or, on, or unintentional incursions of foreign animal diseases. Um, Western Institute of Food Safety and Security, WIPS, uh, serves the global community by conducting research, developing training, and providing outreach programs that will enhance the health and security of people, animals, and the environment. WIPS has a cooperative agreement with FDA to upgrade training for inspectors and investigators of specialty crops, produce, feeds, dairy operations, and tissue residues in meat from animals receiving antibiotics. WIPS is a part of the Rural Domestic Preparedness Consortium to further develop food security curriculum and train first responders in rural areas for animals and food supply disasters. Uh, food Animal Residue Avoidance Data Bank, FARAD. So UC Davis is one of the five universities in the FARAD consortium. FARAD is a national program that serves as the primary source for scientifically based recommendation regarding safe withdrawal um, intervals of drugs and chemicals in food producing animals. As such, FARAD is a key resource for protection of our nation's food supply, including meat, milk, eggs, and against accidental contaminations of animal-derived foods. Um, last but not the least, um, Western Plant Diagnostic Network uh, is a part of the National Plant Diagnostic Network that was established to enhance agricultural security through protecting plant health in agricultural and natural ecosystem in the US. As a part of um, the National Plant Diagnostic Network, we recently established a diagnostic lab to complement all the diagnostics performed at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. There are many more collaborative multidisciplinary activities uh, that are ongoing at UC Davis that focuses on addressing the emerging needs of biodefense. We will continue to, in our effort, and expand into areas that evolve. In addition to advancing the scientific research, we stay active in our outreach activities and focus on making our impacts regionally, nationally, and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohapatra. Dr. Rudolph. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dashnell, Honor, Honorable Commissioner Weinstein, and Dr. George, I'm deeply honored to be speaking with you today. And I'm grateful that the Commission has visited Fort Collins on this topic of ag biosecurity and biodefense. The Front Range has a long history of working in this area from the very foundings of our land-grant heritage. Survival in the West required the understanding of the threats around you and a requirement to sustain resilience in order to thrive. We were humbled to show you some of our assets and accomplishments and proud to show you the passion we feel in that mission. I too also want to thank the students who have come here today and participated in your visit. I think it was really important for them to see our civil service and and the actions of your commission in action, so I thank you for that. As you know, my perspectives on this topic have been informed by my experience working in and out of the biodefense field for most of my career, first at DARPA, which uh, in the mid-90s, birthing some of the first biodefense-related investments there, and then went on to run the DOD and DHS's programs in chem biodefense, as well as starting new companies, both in diagnostics and therapeutics in this area. I cite these experiences so you can understand my remarks with more clarity, not from a position of any particular pride in accomplishment or authority from the nearly $2 billion of taxpayers or venture capital's money I have spent trying to provide solutions, but in terms of how little agility or resilience we have realized in biodefense and ag biosecurity. We simply must and can do better. I'm proud to serve in an institution that is poised to contribute to that goal for Colorado for the U.S. and the good of the planet. Land grants practice science and innovation and apply it in our backyards. And our backyards employ the agricultural infrastructure that supports the U.S. economy, as we heard Secretary Vilsack so eloquently, eloquently speak about. I've come to appreciate that the most significant role land grant institutions can play in a more promising future of infectious disease response and recovery is achieving greater agility and resilience in our communities. 
by applying its long history of One Health approaches and executing its mission of training the next generation workforce and using its evolved triple helix ecosystem, which you saw over your visit. For Colorado and this land grant university, we serve a critical role in helping the region understand new threats and help prepare and respond to continue threats from disease to our people and to our agricultural sector in this state. We do that through our integrated mission of education, research, and service, and through direct engagement with our communities through extension and other means. Colorado State, like many land grants, have unique assets and opportunities. We heard our last speakers speak eloquently about UC Davis. Land grants focus on translation of ideas into practice with one of the oldest US knowledge and tech transfer systems in the country. Many of us house a triple helix of academic industry and government discoverers and innovators that collectively can bring new solutions forward to enhance agility and resilience. You saw on your visit to Colorado the power of the front range of Colorado, which has 29 federal laboratories from USDA, NOAA, NIST, USGS, DOD, DOE, USDA, and all other, and, and all are co-located or located regionally that has facilitated collaboration and integration of federal and land-grant faculty, staff, and programs. We heard from some of these stakeholders today already, and yesterday you visited the USDA National Animal Plant Germplasm Program. This is literally the Fort Knox of agriculture. I know for our students, they'll have to look up what Fort Knox was, but it's our first and last line of defense, and God forbid if we have a catastrophe catastrophic loss of crops or livestock, we will need this bank to recover. It's also the foundational bank of research and knowledge, creation for discovery and innovation, and stored critical material driving data analytics that are likely to drive future response needs. There are also new critical sites for cyber vulnerabilities, and we need to look at that and protect our IT infrastructure around these critical assets. Our land-grant ecosystems are attracting new investments from key strategic partners and spawning new companies involving the supply chain across the agricultural sector. On your visit, you observe the collaborative fabric of these partnerships on this campus that can enhance the pipeline of ideas to practice. These companies, both large and small, are actively engaged with our faculty, our startups, and recruiting our students to fight the next generation of threats to our agricultural sector. We too in our land grant campuses are investing in similar areas and here in the front range we will be cluster hiring and sustainable agriculture and with our partners it's likely that we will have 30 to 40 new scientists in this region focused on livestock health. Our close communication with commodity groups, producers, ensures that the relevance of those hires and the ecosystem will be trained on and focused on these problems. In the current area of increasing threats, with emphasis from events in the past, recent past, such as Amerithrax letters, the H1N1 flu crisis, many land grants were invested in over the course of this period to provide resilient infrastructure, and we heard about that um, already from my colleague to my right. At Colorado State, we established a regional center of excellence in infectious disease funded by NIH that included historic acids in this area but establish new capabilities for innovating and producing countermeasures to these threats. The creation of Biomark, the Biological Manufacturing Academic Resource Center, is a fully CGMP FDA compliant manufacturing facility that is now manufacturing a variety of scales for pilot production and commercial vaccine, commercial manufacturing of countermeasures like vaccines, diagnostics, and cell-based therapeutics. A company accelerator and incubator is also there and it houses major strategic partners and in a building that integrates students, faculty, entrepreneurs, and developers working side by side that could be used in, and are used in outbreak response. After the 2009 H1N1 crisis, ADMs, or Advanced Development Manufacturing Facilities, were funded by DOD and BARDA for increased medical counterproduction for human outbreaks and flu. While these facilities were put in place to increase capacity and infrastructural assets to respond to biodefense, largely based on human outbreaks, they, under, they are underutilized for this purpose. And some could be expanded or modified to accommodate the needs in ag biosecurity countermeasure production. 
And as we face increasing threats in our agricultural base, we have no manufacturing capability in the U.S. to make these countermeasures, as you heard the speaker from Zoetis outline in the gaps he presented to you. The USDA secretary signed an exclusion to current law to move select agents, such as foot and mouth disease and African swine fever, from Plum Island to the new NBAF facility in Manhattan, Kansas, but it was for research and testing and evaluation only, not for manufacturing, and it's still unclear whether we can manufacture these countermeasures in the U.S. NBAF has a very modest square foot manufacturing facility, and as you heard, is likely not to be sufficient to drive the very recommendations you've made and the first steps we have taken in the Farm Bill to fund those recommendations in the vac vaccine bank, which leads me to my first recommendation that I submit for this committee. Establish regional agricultural biodefense advanced manufacturing facilities, or ag ADMs, for ag biosecurity and defense countermeasure stockpiling and co-locate them on or near land-grant institutions. Drive the sustainability of these stockpiles through public-private partnerships that produce solutions for regional endemic disease relief and consider incentives for participation in using those stockpile products. Based on the investments made in the last decade in land-grant institutions around biodefense, a little over one year ago, we established a new coalition, which you heard Secretary Vilsack refer to, called the Coalition for Epi Response, Engagement, and Science, or CERES. The founding members of this coalition are six land-grant institutions, Kansas State, Iowa State, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Texas A&M, UC Davis, and Colorado State, but we are not excluding others. The motivation for creating this coalition was to take advantage of the significant investments already made in our institutions by the U.S. government and to specifically address the strengths we have in providing a unique ecosystem of innovation that is directly linked to engagement activities in our region with state and local officials, to our regional commodity producers, and directly to ranchers and farmers and communities in our states. Over the last year, the series coalition has met four times, and the institutions are committed to leveraging assets across our institutions. We've identified three pillars of activity in the coalition, one you heard about in terms of the SHIELD presentation in UC Davis and CSU. That's around agile countermeasure development and manufacturing, or just-in-time or rapid manufacturing. Surveillance and Pennside diagnostics, and the third pillar is engagement and the use of extension. New efforts are being funded in the coalition in each of these areas, both through competitive federal opportunities as well as the internal seating by the six institutions and the vice chancellors and vice presidents of research with our chancellors and presidents have been supportive of this coalition. Examples of projects of interest include economic modeling of regional sustainable stockpiling. It's a bad business model to have a stockpile for something you'd hope never happens. Two, increased accuracy of Pennside diagnostics using artificial intelligence and machine learning. We can improve the last mile of accuracy and we need more rapid diagnostics as the committee and commissions already recognized. Agile and rapid uh, platform countermeasure, just-in-time production. Four, building extension capacity through Eden and other engagement and communication efforts. And five, creating next generation workforce through ag biosecurity training programs that provide lifelong er learning opportunities. This latter effort is what stands this coalition apart in its pursuit of innovation, the commitment to linking our innovation to workforce development and social cultural engagement in our communities. We've also been active on the Hill and have been meeting to explore legis and have been meeting to explore legislative opportunities that support the series coalition. These include the recent authorization of a GARDA, which was in the Farm Bill and has not been appropriated. This agency was modeled after DARPA and is a needed approach to building teams that embrace agility and resiliency, two of the hallmarks of avoiding technological surprise, which is DARPA's mission. Another bill not yet fully evaluated by us but was introduced recently by Colorado State uh, Senator Michael Bennett is AgTerra, or ARPA-Terra, also modeled after DARPA with a broader mandate that could focus on ag biosecurity outcomes. Three more recommendations that drive for this are support new models of transdisciplinary innovation investment, 
like those pursued in Agarda, Arpatera, or FFAR, dramatically expand ag biosecurity education and training programs in land-grant schools and link them in supportive ways to state ex extension, engagement, and lifelong earning, learning programs, leverage online and certificate program expansion and land grants incurring to encouraging the next generation workforce in emerging areas of interest, interest such as CRISPR-Cas and cyber biosecurity. Four, establish a vet extension reserve force that expands available expertise and capacity from land grants with state and local response. In addition to serving as ambassadors of knowledge, innovation, and practice in our communities, our land grant ecosystem serves as international ambassadors as part of the non Luger investments made at state and at the and at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, where I once served. As we learned from our experience with the former Soviet Union, and now ever more real given we no longer lead in areas of the life sciences, it's critical that we engage with our international partners. On our campuses, in an era of increasing scrutiny on foreign influence, this is becoming more difficult. Last May, I visited Anhui Province in China, where I watched truckloads of pigs being sacrificed in the middle of their ISF outbreak. I was visiting as part of a series of visits from a land-grant co coalition CSU is leading, including some of our series membership, to link China's extension system, which is currently connected to the Ministry of Ag, to their enhanced agricultural university infrastructure. They have built new, eight new ag stations in the province, province and are interested in connecting them to the universities and ag ministries and would like to model our land-grant system of extension. This is an important opportunity that we should pursue. On your visit to Fort Collins, you learned about some of the international programs that we, and I'm, I know my colleagues have as well, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere where outbreaks are currently in, occurring. These critical international engagements could form a new network such as was formed with ProMed. My last recommendation is support the international mission of land grants to establish and engage new programs of international engagement focused on ag biosecurity, encourage, encourage enhanced focus support for international land grant activity in One Health, especially in outbreak regions of the world. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on today's topic and for your commitment to protecting our nation's agricultural assets. Thank you, Dr. Reno, for an outstanding statement. We appreciate uh, your recommendations and uh, your eloquent presentation regarding series in particular, and we'll have some questions in a moment. Dr. Christopher Hennings, thank you for coming, and uh, we'll take your comments now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Land-grant universities are uniquely positioned to play an absolutely critical role in detection, response, recovery, and ultimately in the prevention of any high-consequence agro-event. I also make three specific recommendations that will enhance detection, response, recovery, and prevention. I came from two land-grant colleges, University of Wisconsin in Madison and University of Minnesota. And now I'm from a land-grant university located on the eastern border of South Dakota at South Dakota State University. We have approximately 800,000 people in the state, but we're number five state in cattle numbers. We have four times as many cattle as people. Uh, but we're also number um, one in bison, our national mammal. And agriculture is our number one industry in South Dakota. Plus, we're located next to states that are number one in turkey numbers, which is Minnesota, and number one in swine numbers, which is Iowa. Since I've been at SDSU, our laboratory has been through two foreign animal or emerging disease outbreaks. The 2013 swine and tear coronaviruses, where in less than two months the disease spread to more than 200 herds in 13 states, and the 2015 highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. We tested thousands of samples during these times, but we were also able to have business continuity by continuing to test for our clients for various other pathogens during this time so they could move and market animals. Our laboratory tests primarily for livestock, of which 70% are swine-related cases, 20% are cattle, and the rest are wildlife, food safety, environmental, and companion animal cases. We have over 600 private clients that send samples to us for testing from the region, and we perform 500,000 tests a year. And 70% of our revenue for supporting the function of the laboratory at South Dakota State University is from our user fees. So in that sense, we are a public-private entity. 
We're also part of the USDA National Animal Health Laboratory Network, or NOLN, which is an organization that is a national coordinated network in partnership of federal, state, and university-associated animal health laboratories that provides animal health diagnostic testing, methods, research, and development, and expertise for education and extension to detect biological threats to the nation's animal agriculture, thus protecting animal health, public health, and the nation's food supply. Over half of the 59 laboratories located in 42 states that participate in USDA NOLN are located at land-grant universities. And many of these have biosafety level three laboratories, which we do now as well, that help in performing research and testing and biocontainment and biosecurity of highly risky and contagious pathogens. We're also part of the FDA USDA Food Emergency Response Network and have been activated for food safety threats, and also part of the VET LIRN and FDA genome tracker programs for tracking antibiotic resistance. So my number one recommendation is to continue to fund and bolster the USDA National Animal Health Laboratory Network by making sure there is specific funding for the USDA known, such as would be in the Farm Bill. Early detection is an absolutely important role of veterinary diagnostic laboratories who work with private industries and stopping movement as per federal and state mandates after it is detected, and this is the cornerstone of preventing the wildfires of disease. This is truly a public-private partnership between industry, state, and federal entities, and it allows for decentralized surveillance across the U.S., such as what we're now doing in our laboratories. We're one of 10 laboratories performing testing for surveillance for African swine fever in the United States. Number two, the laboratories located at land-grant universities have the researchers and the reservoirs of researchers that can develop and validate better surveillance tools, provide new technologies for discovery, and advance preventative measures such as vaccine development. For example, soon after the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus outbreak in 2013, we had diagnostic tools already in place for PCR, virus isolation, monoclonal antibodies developed for serology and immunohistochemistry assays. Since we had developed these tools and they were in place already, we were asked by USDA to partner in a root cause investigation of how PEDV arrived in the US. We performed various assays on flexible intermediate bulk containers called feed totes used to transport bulk feed. Um, as these were as shipping containers serving as possible fomites for movement of PED virus. In addition, we partnered with a large regional veterinary practice that has their own research veterinarian who worked closely with our researchers at South Dakota State University. He suspected one of their farms had been infected via feed, and he took a Swiffer and Swiffered the sides of the grain bin, and we detected PEDV. This was the beginning of testing various feed components that get shipped from China and other countries to the U.S. for virus contaminants to determine their survival rates. We simulated the conditions, temperature, humidity, and time of a transoceanic voyage in an environmental chamber and determined that PEDV survived in soybeans for 37 days, which was the amount of time of transport from a shore on, California, shore on China to the middle of Iowa. Since then, various viral mitigants have been tested to decrease virus contamination of feed, and holding times of feed have been determined to decrease the risk of virus viability after storage. These recommendations are now in place for all swine producers to use. Other examples of how researchers work at our university is for the development of new technologies for control of pathogens, such as ways to manipulate the microbiome of various animal species to prevent pathogen growth, such as salmonella and E. coli in the gut of pigs, chickens, and people. In addition, for an example of preventative measures, we also partner with vaccine companies that are developing new vaccines as we're able to adapt our technologies, such as virus neutralization tests to detect protective antibodies to indicate the potential efficacy of those vaccines. Additional vaccine vector platforms are developed in association with private companies and within the land-grant research system, which we have done and are currently doing at SDS, SDSU. We also have our state public health veterinarian in our laboratory, so we can apply One Health solutions to disease that we see. So number two recommendation is to reinforce and support the role of veterinary diagnostic laboratories housed at many of the land-grant universities across the U.S. 
since they are at the front lines of seeing new and emerging diseases and have the researchers to conduct meaningful, quick, and applied research. They also provide teaching of current and future generation of veterinarians and scientists. One area that needs strengthening within the veterinary diagnostic laboratories is the information technology, or IT, for messaging and mapping of outbreak and surveillance data. Within veterinary diagnostic laboratories, IT is a major and necessary communicator of epidemiological data and testing results that needs to be relayed quickly. We do not have enough IT people to work within universities and then keep them there. Even within state systems, we need better IT solutions. As one of my colleagues stated, we can order, fill, and track a package from source to doorstep from Amazon in 24 hours, but we can't track animal movements or disease that quickly using the current IT system that we have. The swine industry now itself is funding to get some of these systems in place, specifically for endemic diseases primarily. So number three, prevention, response, and recovery of trade impacting disease preparedness needs state, federal, and private industry expertise that works together. State and federal animal health agencies have the coordination and authority to establish official standards and health certificates, status certifications across legally recognized areas, states, and regions. While private industry has the resources, capacity, and industry know-how to combat disease. Therefore, the number three recommendation is to formalize partnerships between the public and private sector that leverage the expertise and discovery capability that exist in our land-grant universities and private sector industry partners which is an opportunity for creating impacts in trade impacting disease preparedness. Our private partners currently can opt into various programs to provide continuity of business if a foreign animal disease was detected through the programs of the secured pork, poultry, beef, and milk supply. However, there is little support for proactive surveillance of foreign animal diseases. Some aggregate sampling procedures could be used for trade impacting diseases but it would take government authorization to permit and funding to put this in place. And as was mentioned um, by Mr. Leachman, ways to incentivize the industries to participate. So for surveillance, since a dairy cow with a foot and mouth disease can shed as many as 10 to the fourth infectious virus particles per mill of milk, milk stored in holding tanks on dairy farms represents an attractive herd sample for FMD surveillance testing. In addition, more herd type samples such as oral fluids or processing fluids and pooling of tissue samples from pigs can test more pigs than single individual samples. The swine industry is already using these sample types for testing for endemic disease, and we need them for surveillance for foreign animal disease. In poultry, some aggregate samples are monitored for influenza and include sampling water used for drinking in the barns. The private sector's ingenuity in knowing what practical processes and samples work for surveillance is absolutely important to tap into and listen for. Our university also partners with the private sector by training students for the private sector. Currently, we're developing a program in rural veterinary medicine with the University of Minnesota, where we'll train 20 veterinary students for their first two years of veterinary school, and they'll be finishing at the University of Minnesota. This will help since only about 1.8% of veterinarians in 2017, we're in exclusive large animal practices, and only 4.5 were in predominantly food animal practices. And debt is high for veterinarians, um, so anything that can be done to lessen the debt load is important. There's the Veterinary Loan Repayment Act, and this is helpful to continue. And we need to train these veterinarians in foreign animal disease recognition because they are on the front line of this service. So my three recommendations are to continue to fund and bolster the USDA NOM by making sure there's specific funding for the USDA National Animal Health Laboratory Network in the Farm Bill. Number two, reinforce and support the role of veterinary diagnostic laboratories housed at many of the land-grant universities across the US since they are at the front lines of seeing new and emerging diseases and have the researchers to develop new tests, reagents, and control methods and supporting these IT capabilities for tracking disease. And number three, formalize partnerships between the public and private sector for better proactive surveillance of trade impacting diseases, and especially using some of these aggregate type samples. So in summary, I'd like to just conclude with a slide that I brought, if you have it. There we go. Um, this is the model that we use for our South Dakota Animal Disease Research and Diagnostic Lab. 
where we look at what's happening out in the field, that's our extension arm and our frontline veterinarians who send samples to it. If it's new and emerging, we apply research to it and try to put solutions back into the field uh, to close the loop for diagnostics, vaccine, and other control methods. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Christopher Hennings, for a, a very excellent presentation. <coughs> Let me just uh, begin with your third recommendation, the need for a more refined and elaborate public-private partnership. Uh, the, the theme of this panel has been land-grant universities' roles and responsibilities. I really can't think of anything more important for your role and responsibility than and to create the kind of public-private coordination that is so important to our success and so critical. And yet it seems to me that uh, there's an old saying in Washington, when all is said and done, there's always a lot more said than done. And I worry that when it comes to the coordination of entities at all levels and the effort to, to bring together this public-private partnership that you so powerfully described, that there's a lot more said than done. And I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in your perspective as to what the impediments are to doing a better job at coordinating and creating that partnership. Where, where do we need to put our emphasis to make that happen so that there is more done than said? So I think part of that is really listening to the private sector. So I appreciated Mr. Leachman's comments um, that we need incentives, you know, for private industry to get involved. I was sitting by a um, beef producer on the plane here from South Dakota, and he makes very little on beef cattle right now. And so to even do an RFID tag, you know, in his cattle is a big expense, even though it may be, I don't know, eight to 10 bucks, you know, per head. Um, so there needs to be some incentive for them to do that. and. Uh, you know, it, it may be funding, I don't know. The other thing is, um, one of the examples that was brought up was the National Pro Poultry Improvement Plan. So that's a grassroots type of organization that started with some federal support. And uh, looking at that type of structure, um, it's been proposed by uh, some of my great people that I collaborate with at Iowa State University in the other diagnostic labs there, um, where, um, you know, we need that for the swine industry. Uh, to be able to get some active surveillance going for these trade impacting diseases. And uh, so uh, those types of partnerships um, could start with those kinds of examples. Dr. Rando? Uh, I think, you know, part of the reason we started putting some coalitions together, you hear about SHIELD and about Ceres, is just to become more active and, and rather than talk. And, you know, right now, we're not incentivized even in the pursuit, our faculty, uh, even though there's a trend for more multidisciplinary center-like, but you know, the land-grant institutions are competing against one another for federal funds. So there hasn't been really a cooperative realization that the funding, the way we fund solutions has to be cooperatively. We tend to pit universities against one another in, in competitive processes, which is healthy to get the best ideas forward but often leaves us fractured in terms of who gets what and who advances what idea. The uh, other comment I would make is, and all vice presidents of research on a campus are responsible for tech transfer. And the intellectual property issues now are, of course, in the light. We're all, again, on foreign influence. The idea of IP leakage from our campus is a big concern. And we'll push back against, it's certainly the kind of collaborations we need internationally. But we recognize that IP is a transactional property that where an idea, idea gets scaled and a company realizes some profit from that idea. Now, universities have worked hard, and I think certainly land grants because of their ethos, our philosophy is get it out of the university. We're not laying golden eggs. We're laying eggs that we want people to make omelets with or scale up into some recipe, and we've got to get the property out. 
Now, I know there's bi-dole uh, discussions going on in the federal government about how to more efficiently deal with the investment we make in science and technology, but I think this is an area, just like when DARPA had other transaction authorities that allowed IP sharing to take place, there are some things that we could be doing to incentivize the sharing of ideas and recognizing the transactional barriers in IP that sometimes inhibit those collaborative networks from moving forward. So, um, to get to your specific question, Senator Dessel, about the impediments, if you, if you think about creating public-private partnership at the granularity of each and every institution, it will be a challenge. Um, faculty, as my colleague just mentioned, uh, faculty will not be incentivized too much in order to do that. So one way to address this issue, if I can... Uh, give a recommendation, and which which pretty much uh, piggybacks one of the recommendations suggested by uh, Dr. Rudolph is to create uh, centers of excellence, a few centers of excellence, uh, national centers of excellence, which will uh, bring together multiple land grant universities and other universities to work together collaboratively, and in that collaborative environment. We try, to, we try to actually make that a charter of this collaboration in order to develop more public-private partnership and grow on from that. So that, that, will be, um, that will have more impact on our faculty, that will have more impact on the students who are the future researchers in the area, and we can certainly achieve that goal. As I think about the collaboration between land grants and the federal government in particular, I'm struck by how many federal facilities are right here at Fort Collins and how in some ways that, that represents the degree of commitment on the part of the federal government to, uh, to get out of Washington and to be as present as, as uh, they certainly appear to be here. Uh, and yet I think this may be more the exception than the rule from what I have seen nationwide. I'd be interested in, in your perspectives as to why it is that we can't create more of a collaborative structural entity, an infrastructure that would accommodate greater, greater uh, uh, interaction, integration, uh, between the federal uh, levels and all the agencies and land grants, is it lack of resources, lack of priority, lack of leadership, all of the above? To what extent do we face sort of a series of encumbrances in bringing together this array of impressive infrastructure to an entity that, that can work more in unison than it does today? Any recommendations and thoughts on that relationship and what we could do to make it a higher priority? Yeah, so uh, one aspect, you know, having been in academics for almost 30 years now, well, what I have seen over the years is, if you, if you go 20 years back or so, the, um, the acknowledgement, appreciation, and reward structure at the faculty level was not as much tuned to multidisciplinary collaborative research as it is now. So things have things have changed, and things have changed for good in terms of uh, embrace, embracing the uh, collaborative nature and working with uh, federal agencies and all. So I, I think we are, we are moving in the right direction, and having leadership uh, at the federal side as well as leadership uh, at the vice chancellor's, vice president's level uh, at campuses, so we certainly can achieve the goal that uh, you are envisioning. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I've actually um, been pleased with the federal interactions with our lab in particular. And I think that, you know, with the USDA National Animal Health Laboratory Network, there is the recognition that, you know, it needs to be um, across states and not just designated to one location, obviously. And so with other federal programs, like I mentioned, the uh, uh, FDA USDA Food Emergency Response Network um, that we're part of in our veterinary laboratory. In fact, I think we're one of the few veterinary laboratories that has a fern lab. And then the Veterinary Laboratory Investigative Response Network, um, which we've also been participating in. 
And, you know, here we find things like, um, you know, contamination of dog treats and things like that with bacterial chem contaminations. And so, you know, it involves a number of um, other species besides livestock. And then the FDA Genome Tracker Program, we've been fortunate to have a very good bioinformatics person at our university. So I think that these federal groups have recognized that it's not just one location where you might find the expertise. And so visits to different laboratories, I think, would be really important, different land-grant universities, to see what's actually really there. Dr. Uh, I think, uh, Senator, the, the area that may be worth looking at is in the structure of cooperative agreements. Uh, what you saw at Colorado State is, in fact, unique, in an, and I'll point to one cooperative agreement that I think has been very fruitful, productive, and, and unique. NOAA has a cooperative agreement with Colorado State and, and a very large investment made in weather analytics and satellite and weather collection, and we, uh, in the front range, uh, really do put out the highest resolution weather predictions for hurricane season and things like that. That's a very long-standing set of cooperative agreements NOAA set up with Boulder, with CSU, with a few other campuses, and has been able to sustain through the years. Other cooperative agreements have degraded over time because of the flat federal S&T budget and the recognition that each one of these agents, agencies has their own internal labs to feed and, and maintain. And as the budget numbers became flat, the competition between ideas generated out of those internal federal laboratories and outside those federal laboratories in the universities or otherwise became to start eroding those cooperative agreements. And so in many cases, uh, they were under pressure to have more of those funds be competitively uh, you know, competed for. So the cooperative agreement structure that the U.S. government can take with land-grant institutions may be one area to look at to see how could we bolster it up in a way that, uh, that promotes sharing, collaboration, perhaps I, uh, IP sharing, and very focused on the set of problems that that cooperative agreement, depending on the agency in this case, likely out of USDA, but as you know from your commission work, there are so many agencies involved with this problem. Which one do you do a cooperative agreement with? So uh, if we ever get to that recommendation that you've made about some coordinating function for biodefense, which is desperately needed, the things that would make sense to follow would be a look at how do we establish some cooperative agreements with the right stakeholders that can create a set of conditions that would allow ideas to flow and flow more agi agilely through the system. Well, thank you all. Dr. George? Um, so one of the things we've heard uh, this uh, week is about um, the mission of the land-grant universities, one of which is, or missions, one of which is to translate knowledge into practice. Um, now, I also think that there may be a role for translating practice back into knowledge, meaning there's a lot going on in, uh, in the land around the land-grant university. Um, the universities are supposed to be very connected to the community, and they're, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, surveillance in the, in the nation is, I don't want to say it's lacking so much as it is. We've got too many things going in too many different directions. Um, but in addition, there are things that uh, the communities are, are doing. They're noticing disease first. They're noticing problems in the, in the food chain first. They're noticing that they're not getting the supplies they need through their own supply chain, uh, you know, and so forth. So I know I'm asking kind of an esoteric question, but um, how would you translate, given the experiences of the people in your communities uh, that surround the land-grant universities, how would you translate their practice back into knowledge that the university would would uh, would generate and then, you know, communicate through the academic arena? Dr. Hennings. I know in our laboratory we have a 16-member animal disease research and diagnostic laboratory advisory committee, so it's a 16-member board. All of the commodity group executive directors are on it, so <clears throat> poultry and beef and the stock growers, um, as well as um, yeah, poultry, just all of the commodity groups. And so we get input from them. 
uh, on a regular basis. We also um, interact quite extensively with South Dakota Veterinary Medical Association. So obviously veterinarians are on the front lines throughout the community. So their headquarters actually where we, we do all the work actually within our department as far as the um, outreach um, to South Dakota VMA members. Their secretary is with us. Their executive director is actually out in Pierre, the capital of South Dakota. But so we maintain that connection with them there. And of course, we listen uh, quite extensively to our South Dakota Animal Industry Board and our state public, our state veterinarian. And again, our, our um, extension veterinarian is also our state public health veterinarian. So he meets with the public health department on a routine basis. In fact, they pay for part of his salary. So he knows what's going on just within the public health um, sector. And the public health um, director is actually on our advisory committee as well. So we have those connections, again, on the One Health side. So those are just some avenues that we can listen to others out there to find out what's going on. Yeah, I would say that the extension system in our land grants uh, has, as said before, the historic engagement with our communities, that was intended to be a two-way system. And in addition to transferring knowledge out, is what are the problems of our, our state residents. And with a, a person in every county, it sounds like we're well covered, but the reality is the extension system has been bled over the years and is terribly under-resourced. And it has a very large mission as the land grant, you know, intellectual capacity grew. We now are, are, we have public health extension, we have vet extension, we have all kinds of needs coming from the community and not enough people to serve it. So I think extension is a two-way system, and I think investing in extension in the right way, in addition to the boards, which we all have, we have an ag advisory board that is at an institutional level with commodity groups that you know, are continually engaging. You've seen the investments they have on our campus by putting their names on buildings and things. That's just not for advertisement. It's because they are engaging with us and informing us about their problems. So I don't think that the, the microphone is an on. I think we're in receive mode, but we're not able to respond because we don't have the resources to really cover all the issues our communities are bringing us. And ag is just one of them, right? So the extension system, I think, is still the appropriate means by which to look at engagement. And the last thing I'd say on this topic is that in our institution, and I think other land grants have done this, Engagement's been laid, uh, raised to the institutional level. So we have a vice president of engagement in our institution, the director of extension reports at that level, not into the ag college. In many other land grants, the director of extension still reports into the ag college. But the reality is we're really serving communities, and even in this problem, we recognize it's a one health problem. We can't just address it in the ag channel. So. We're very under-resourced in the extension system, and it's the most obvious place to start, but I think the institutional level of engagement is another place to look at resourcing opportunity. So in our campus, in addition to the general extension program, we have uh, um, specific extension efforts for ag and uh, veterinary medicine. So for example, the ag-related extension program, they spread across the entire Central Valley of California, and uh, they work with the farmers directly, so the uh, exchange of information is always bi-directional. They are in the forefront talking to the people, are, talk, are addressing the issues where the rubber meets the road. Uh, in, I'll give you one example regarding the veterinary medicine also. Um, um, in Tulare, California, which is about three hours from campus, we have established um, a center where fourth year DVM students from all over the country, they come there to gain experience uh, uh, how to interact with public. And you know, it, it is, it is uh, highly pursued after where uh, you know, they get experience um, of interacting with common people, with the common problems, uh, right in the field over there before they even start their career. So that is that is a huge uh, that creates a huge impact on their future career uh, progress. So one of the reasons I'm asking is we we talked earlier about surveillance um, and what we need in the way of a national biosurveillance system. Um, you know, the federal government has attempted to do that by 
uh, recognizing rightly that uh, many, if not all, of the federal departments have information flows, data reporting going up, and the, in, this initial attempt was to sort of analyze everything up at the top federal level and then come up with some kind of national picture that would eventually, I guess, come back down to the states and localities. So that hasn't worked particularly well, and I don't think anybody here is you know, shocked and astounded to, to hear that. But one of the ideas that's come up um, uh, and not, not just today, but, but previously, is to um, help the states develop their own biosurveillance picture in which everything, any possible uh, data flow would come in. Um, not just you know the three elements of the One Health System, but, but everything we can possibly think of. Now, the difficulty with that, if you just go with uh, an office somewhere in the state government, or uh, perhaps in an industry organization, the difficulty is there's a whole academic side to this when we're talking about analysis and what to do with data um, and forecasting trends and that sort of thing. So the idea has come up that this would be an ideal role for land-grant universities. They're supposed to be connected to the you know, communities. Obviously, there's an academic side to the university. Um, and, uh, you know, we're hearing today that uh, the universities are already setting up coalitions and regional activities and stuff anyhow. So uh, it might even be easier for the different uh, land-grant universities to all just talk to each other all across the United States and then form a national picture that goes from down and goes up to the federal government for their use uh, instead of vice versa. So could the three of you talk to me, respond to that idea? If you don't mind, that, that is a great topic because the big data era in front of us is an opportunity to act differently around uh, prediction and who does the prediction, as you're pointing out, Dr. George. And in Colorado, based on these federal laboratories, I'm the head of CoLabs, which is an organization of those laboratories. They're actually talking about merging those kinds of data feeds from weather, from animals, from humans. And Colorado has a very coordinated health information exchange network that is viable and, uh, and opportunistic in the very direction you're saying. And of course, in the investments of applied math in the terms of the day of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have the ability to look for patterns of information and predictions from those patterns, even if we're not sure exactly what is the hypothesis that drives that pattern. But yet it could give us early warning, just like in looking at sort of uh, information flows from consumer products informed us about uh, human outbreaks like Pedialyte coming off the shelf. So you're absolutely right to point out that the era of big data is empowering to decentralize prediction. States have unique data assets. Colorado has very unique data assets deep in aerospace, weather, health, and combining those on a state level is very much on our minds for Colorado. And so I think you're absolutely right to bring that up as an opportunistic approach and a strategy if the feds can't sort of organize from the top, states will take this up on their own and we're already starting to do that. So I would say that the industries are already doing that. So the swine industry has always been really proactive, especially in information technology. Even back when I was going to school, in the 1980s, um, they had programs called Pig Champ, which would, you know, basically track how many pigs per litter and weight gain and all of that. And so, um, right now, there is, and again, I'll give kudos to my colleagues at Iowa State University, um, working through the Swine Information Center and the National Pork Board. Um, they funded what's called a swine disease reporting system. You can go online and look at it. It's a consortium of four laboratories. Uh, data, um, Kansas State University, Iowa State University, South Dakota State University, and University of Minnesota. So it has aggregate data. It, it is um, confidential in the sense that there's no reporting of, of prem IDs. Uh, it's just by state um, or owner names or veterinarians, but it tracks uh, at least four or five endemic diseases, PERS virus, PED, porcine delta coronavirus, mycoplasma, high pneumonia these endemic diseases in swine, and it tracks it over time. I believe it started from about 2012, uh, and we have that data, and it's in real time. The issues now are funding as well as, and again, it's all funded through the swine industry themselves. They want this. They want to know what's going on and what to be on the outlook for. 
So that could definitely use some um, impetus and additional funding, you know, to keep it going because obviously, like I said, the wine producers are the ones that are funding it. Um, but it's been very useful. We used to get on the phone and talk between the labs at 6 a.m. in the morning to say, what are you seeing and what are you seeing? And this way, it's quantitative and it's in real time. But again, it goes back to the IT capabilities. All of it really needs to be HL7 messaged. So we had to go through another grant that was funded through the pork board uh, to be able to get the common language, the uh, links and oids that are necessary to make it a common language so that all of our tests would be able to be communicated correctly and, and put into this one database. And that took a lot of time and effort. The same thing needs to be done on the cattle side. Um, but again, um, I don't know in this respect whether cattle producers will fund it, but the swine producers definitely funded this. So it's ongoing now. So, um, I mean, it, in a way, that's a great great comment, um, Dr. George. So uh, if you if you look around, like, um, for example, Microsoft has been pushing hard on digital agriculture. So a lot of... Uh, concept or a lot of aspects of agriculture has uh, can be moved to the digital world. Uh, similarly, uh, all the biodefense, uh, agro-defense areas, there are a lot of uh, concept that can be simplified through predictions. And prediction needs huge amount of data. And we do have huge amount of data out there. And with all the advances in AI, now we are pretty much close to having tools that can analyze all the data sets, correlates the data set, which was uh, not possible earlier. So if we, if we make a collaborative effort of gathering, analyzing, and correlating uh, data sets, um, which, which could be completely multimodal, visual, text, uh, images, uh, videos, and other types of graphics thing, if we can figure out a good way to uh, integrate all of those, analyze them, and use AI in order to extract information out of those, we will be in a new world then. Can I ask another question? Could I, uh, I, I, I mm -hmm. just before we excuse this wonderful panel, let me just uh, explore a little bit Dr. Rudolph's, uh, one of his final recommendations, which was that we've got to build a better outreach and collaborative effort internationally. And I, 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 you know, we've had such a great discussion today, but we haven't talked a lot about international cooperative effort. And so much of what is happening in this space is not national, it's not local, it's international. And, and its implications, and its reach, and its impact, its consequences. And yet I, I, uh, I would apply my admonition about saying and doing to our international efforts as well. But I'd, be, I'd, I'd love for each of you, if you could, from your perspective, first to talk about what you are doing, secondly, what you'd like to do, and third, what is the most important thing we do to make sure that your aspirations from an international perspective could actually be attained? Um, so let me just start and we'll go down the panel. Okay, so um, and the first part is what we are doing, and in my um, initial statements, I talked about predict, and I kind of referred to this new project that we just got funded, preempt. Uh, this is a DARPA project, and we received uh, about nine point five million dollars for three years. Uh, so basically, this project is uh, is all about uh, you know concentrating our efforts on uh, and this Lassa virus, Ebola virus, and the and the likes of that, and how they impact and how they uh, are potential threats for deployed military personnel, uh, as well as local communities in uh, uh, African, um, uh, in pl places in Africa and many other places in the world. So, uh, so both predict and preempt are very much global in nature. So for example, preempt, we just got started. Our team is working very closely with uh, Sierra Leone government and they work with the University of McCarney at uh, Sierra Leone. And so pretty much most of the work is being done over here, there because you know the access to the information is, is, is much easier over there. It's first-hand information uh, and the outbreaks are there. So they are right there where the action is needed. So citing that as an example, you know, that's, that's where I value 
the international collaboration that uh, you were referring to, Senator Dershel. Uh, we, you know, unlike many other things, um, the, um, the biodefense and agro-defense areas, they will not be bounded by the uh, divides in the countries and all that thing. If, if, if something spreads, uh, there will, you cannot erect a wall or anything to stop it in anywhere. So we need international collaborations. If, uh, you know, like I've heard one comment, I don't know where, that if you want to be economically strong, you want people around you to be also economically strong. It's the same thing over here. If we want to be safe, uh, we want people around the world to be also safe uh, in, in, in this context. So we have to reach out and uh, uh, extend our research activities, uh, go and reach out to people, find places where these outbreaks uh, are uh, more eminent and how, how and what we can do in order to uh, address those issues while, you know, as being an academician, that those will provide us as independent open laboratories to learn and help the future generation learn from that also. Thank you for bringing up this issue because I think it is perhaps the most critical investment we can make. And as we learned historically, it was the most critical investment we made when we learned about the Soviet offensive bioweapons program was to specifically reach out. The STP program created separate funding to encourage collaboration between U.S. and Soviet scientists that was run out of DARPA in the late 90s. And it was very prolific because what it did was establish the relationships which allowed something like ProMed to be in a successful network of information coming from scientists who were seeing things and reporting things in a scientific collaboration without concern about foreign influence or what the federal government thought about that information because it was science, peer-reviewed science that uh, was uh, reported uh, globally. So I think we need to be intentional about that. Now, right now, we're very indiscreet about that. So DITRA runs a biological threat program, and the, that program is run by Lidos, a big defense contractor. But if you look under the hood of the Lidos contract, there are a whole bunch of land grants serving as ambassadors for DITRA. Similarly, with USAID, they've employed land grants, in this case, to be passed through. So we've had certain uh, USAID programs where land grants are expected to manage large international programs. That's not always the best way to use an academic institution. We're getting better at those things. But there seems to be a lack of intentional investment, especially in today's era, for an influence on recognizing that this engagement is critical to the solution. We ought to be now looking at a specific program with China. I mentioned the one on international extension where 11 land grants are supported by USDA. But we need to do more because it's not all about ag. Now, I know we have real concerns about genome sequencing because the Beijing Genome Institute dominates most of the U.S. sequencing needs, and we can't afford that issue. So there are, you know, concerns about what information do we allow international partners to have uh, on the U.S. base. But these are critical engagements, and I can tell you, having worked for Ditcher, it's very, or, and I imagine I've heard this from my USDA colleagues, it's very hard to walk into those countries and, and engage as a federal official right now. And so, really, the land-grant institutions are the best ambassadors we have right now for this international engagement, but there's a, a real scarcity of recognizing that mission or investing in it intentionally. To, uh, to reciprocate, I mean, do, what kind of reception are you getting? Well, first of all, maybe let's, let, me, let me finish the panel, but I'd be interested in just how, uh, how you have uh, been received as you have approached international entities for greater cooperation. But Dr. Chris Rannings, uh, could you talk to that and then just the general? I would say that we've been very well received. I mean, it's difficult to be in infectious disease research without being international from the get-go because, uh, you know, infectious disease knows no boundaries, right? So just the fact that you've done research within a given area of an infectious disease that affects multiple countries, people want to know about it. So just going to those meetings over the years has been a great experience for me and for 
um, some graduate students. And um, so those international collaborations definitely just kind of naturally happen if you're doing an area of research that uh, is of interest to those countries. Um, it, we've had, uh, I, I just got back on June from the internet, first international veterinary diagnostic conference in China. So that's just started and uh, it's very important to have that collaboration right now. Um, and we've obviously had, our extension vet has been to a number of places as well, but I think, you know, the funding um, investment just needs to be made, especially for getting students trained and getting graduate students for that exposure. But we have faculty, you know, who go to currently right in Taiwan and different places. So oftentimes they bring back graduate students from different countries as well. So I think there's really pretty good collaborations that, that happen. Yeah, I would um, agree that um, overall we're well received at the scientific level because of the, you know, sort of recognition that we're all scientists working on problems. And of course, in some parts of the world, like China, as you move up into the ministries, there's a lot of reservation about, you know, how are we going to engage intellectual property concerns? I mean, there there is a realistic part of the relationship that has to be dealt with. Um, but when a country goes through what they're going through, I think they have the same kind of reactions that we do, is, you know, that we have to do better at this. And the question is, does a country like China think they can go on it on their own? And so far, what we've seen is they're asking for help. And the question is, how can we give them help and help ourselves, which is, I think, part of the purpose we want to give them help, is it's a two-way street. We'll have more engagement. We'll be listening and learning from them as well. But how do we do so in a way that meets the current sort of screening of whether we're protecting our own national security assets? And, uh, and I think it's very difficult, especially in life sciences, where we don't lead. I mean, if we don't engage in certain areas like stem cell work or CRISPR-Cas, we're going to be left behind. And so I, I don't know if we have a choice but to go into it eyes wide open, be careful, but realize the upside's better than the downside. Uh, in terms of international collaborations, almost all the time we have felt that we are being welcomed with the partners, uh, and there has been um, all the engagements we have had in Asian countries and African countries. Um, they all have been moving very well. There is, a, there is a lot of excitement from both sides, from our faculty as well as uh, the researchers from the other side. Uh, and we, we have valued those uh, collaborations and the access to various facilities and uh, working with people, um, both researcher as well as students. Uh, it has been... Uh, an immense wealth for us, and we would continue, we would love to continue in that aspect. Uh, yes, given the current climate, we are a little bit uh, careful about the uh, IP issues, uh, especially the foreign influence um, aspects that has been raised. So we, we are, uh, you know, since our programs in agriculture and vet med have been there for a long, long time, um, our faculty, they have figured it out and how you can do effective collaboration while protecting the IP aspect. So, so things are going really good. They have been quite successful in uh, attracting foreign students. Um, we talked yesterday about the number of foreign students you have here at Colorado State. And I know from my own experience at South Dakota State, we've had, we've had uh, I think an increasing number of foreign students. To what extent does that offer opportunities for greater collaboration? Um, do many of them enroll in, 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 in this sphere of educational experience? Or, and, 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 and what, if anything, do, do governments do to promote that kind of exchange? Are they, are, are, do they uh, encourage it? Do you, find, do you find it harder these days for students to come to our country and to participate in land-grant educational opportunities, or is it getting, is it getting easier? So, so there, are, um, there are a sizable number of uh, foreign students in our ag programs, a um, little less in terms of uh, percentage in the wet med area. Um, in terms of the, the interest of students, uh, it has been increasing. Uh, there has been a bit of concern from uh, 
the Chinese students about the visa issues uh, that they are facing in, in China. Um, but with all other countries, you know, things, uh, um, the interest is growing and we do, uh, uh, we do see an increase in foreign students. I would say the uh, difference, there's a difference between undergraduate and graduate um, students. In the graduate student case, it's becoming more difficult to get foreign graduate students into the U.S. and the visa issues that you spoke about are probably constraining more of the graduate student population than the undergraduate student population. But I think from the optics point of view, universities are currently being looked at for how many students are on their campuses, what issues do those present in terms of Again, leakage of IP or leakage of, but I would say I haven't seen any slow slowing of the recruitment of those students yet on the undergraduate level, and I think um, in our case, as we spoke about, it's been a, a, a pretty pretty steady growth, and and again, it's driven in part because we all are trying to diversify our campuses, but let's be frank, it's also being driven by the economics of state schools in which the out. Out, these foreign students are paying out-of-state tuitions. And so they're attractive from a revenue point of view as well as the diversity inclusion point of view on our campuses, which is probably why we won't stop pursuing them. Yeah, I would say in our department, we have more graduate students that are international in origin um, than directly from the U.S. Um, we've had some issues with uh, some grad students leaving and then not able to come back, um, which makes it difficult for the research, obviously. Um, we've had some funded students from Egypt, for example, that's worked out well. Um, so uh, I think the question is, how do we get U.S. students, though, interested in graduate school as well, um, which we, we really don't see quite as much as um, U.S. students wanting to go to graduate school. Dr. George, any final questions? Well, you asked my international question, Senator. <laughs> you know, one of the things we talked about earlier was um, uh, who, which departments sent students here today. Um, and as, as Senator Daschle mentioned before, we've been elsewhere to other universities, um, and it's just been interesting to see. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, and again, just, just your thoughts, this activity that we're talking about is not a purely agricultural activity, even though we're talking about agricultural defense. Um, there's a significant portion of this that's important to us um, called poli-sci. You know, the political side of this is just as important. We can all sit around and have great ideas, but if we can't translate them up into the hallowed halls somewhere else for them to make some decisions and get funding and et cetera coming back down, uh, we're going to fail. Um, for, for each of you, what has been your interaction on the political side, and how do you get that information out to your students to help them move things along? So we have, um, in, at the university level, we have uh, uh, a unit which deals with uh, uh, the relationship with federal government as well as the state government. So that unit takes the leadership role in uh, facilitating our faculty members and researchers, uh, meet some of the representatives, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and we uh, we have both presence in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., as well as in Sacramento, in the state capital, to, um, to organize uh, meetings uh, around those themes. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a graduate student uh, something it's related to graduate student lobbying activities uh, day in sacramento the, so we take um, our star graduate students to spend a day in the capitol building meeting with the representatives and sharing their thoughts and views on uh, how the land grant mission is being met and how they feel about and they share their own experiences that has been a very popular event and uh, uh, we kind of end all of the events with a few asks, and uh, um, more often than not, it, they, it has been turned out very positive. Yeah, I, I think uh, we offer the same programs at both the undergraduate and graduate level of that type of engagement. I think the most um, surprising attribute of my experience in this land-grant university is, the, in fact, the power of the students to inform us not only um, at a political science level, but 
inform our faculty about new areas of investigation, which, you know, in one of the commission's interests around cyber bio, we just ran an event where, you know, our students informed us as to what was possible and what we should worry about. Um, all of our campuses are politically charged right now, as you might imagine, with First Amendment issues, if not the scene we have with, you know, a very polarized society. So we have a highly engaged student population on our campuses, and I think we could find better ways to engage them on this issue, especially in states like Colorado, where 25 percent of our incoming class are first-generation students who are coming from the regions that have a touch on this issue, and, and maybe it is an opportunity to provide some more proactive experiences around this particular issue in the political science realm, because most of the programs we're referring to are sort of general training programs about civil service and the engagement of political officials, but we actually do need more people in the next generation to be articulate in communicating at this interface of technology or ideas and practice. So I'm not quite sure if I understand the question exactly. Are you talking more on the international side? Um, so, um, okay, I, I'm just thinking about obviously we do have processes in place for helping students and getting them here through visas and all that kind of thing. Um, one area of diversity, I guess, that's just been started at our university that's um, not international, but it's actually um, you know, for indigenous people. So it's called the Wokini Initiative, and that's been started to be able to uh, have Native Americans within the state um, be able to be recognized within the university system and be involved in a number of different activities and to present their views and that kind of thing. So it's really pretty front and center uh, at South Dakota State University now. Um, so that's been something that's been, I think, good for um, the diversity issues in our um, university. Sure. Well, this has been a terrific discussion. We thank each of you for your presentation and your very, very thoughtful answers to our many questions. Uh, this has been, I think, uh, just an extraordinary day, a good opportunity to hear from the best and the brightest in this, in this area. We are awaiting the arrival uh, of Congressman Agus, who's now who's uh, going to be here shortly. But uh, once again, we thank each of you for being part of this important day. Thank you. We'll take a short break until the congressman arrives. He should be here momentarily.
If I can have everyone's attention, we'll, uh, this was a shorter break than we anticipated. As soon as I announced the break, uh, Congressman Nagus was able to arrive. And so if uh, you'll take your seats, we'll, we'll get started. Let me just... Uh, Let me just welcome Congressman Agus uh, to this session. We have had a remarkable day. It's been a very informative day. Uh, I'm sure you're not surprised that Colorado State has been an exemplary host and uh, provided us with enormous uh, opportunity, I think, to better understand the role of land-grant universities as we consider agriculture and biodefense. Uh, it's been an informative day with uh, just an extraordinary uh, series of, of, of witnesses and, and uh, experts who shared their, their uh, expertise with us. And so I can't think of a better way to cap the day than to hear from Colorado's own congressman. And uh, we appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us this afternoon and to share your thoughts. So the, 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 the desk is yours. Well, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Senator Daschle, for your service to our country uh, and, of course, uh, the service that you uh, performed in the United States Senate for many years and the service that you're performing now with your colleagues on the Bipartisan Commission on such an important issue to the future of our country and, ultimately, the national security of the United States and, of course, uh, to the wonderful staff that you've assembled, including Dr. George. Uh, and I also would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Colorado State University and, uh, in particular, Chancellor Tony Frank for hosting this discussion today, and uh, I'm glad to hear uh, that they have been exemplary hosts. I had no doubt uh, that that would be the case. Uh, I have the honor of representing the 2nd Congressional District in the United States Congress, which of course includes uh, Larimer County and Fort Collins, Colorado State University, as well as Boulder County and uh, the University of Colorado, uh, where I'm an alumnus, uh, as well as several other counties, mountain communities across Colorado, uh, and many agriculture communities uh, that have a pivotal role to play with respect to the matters that we will discuss uh, today. And as you said, uh, Senator Daschle, I don't know that I could have uh, said it any better than you did, that as a land-grant campus, uh, the University of Colorado State University, I should say, has been at the forefront of battling infectious diseases worldwide and promoting human and animal health for decades. And so uh, ultimately, uh, I imagine that the expertise they've offered today and, of course, the, the witnesses that you've assembled, uh, that their expertise has been invaluable. Uh, I am grateful to be surrounded by so many bright minds who are leading the work on biodefense right here in the 2nd District. And ultimately, I'm grateful to learn uh, more uh, from the commissioners uh, and, of course, these witnesses uh, so that we can better understand how I and my colleagues can be a better partner uh, for the work that you all are engaged in with respect to uh, the work we are engaged in in Congress. I'm also incredibly humbled to have been asked to speak alongside such leading voices like former Secretary Tom Vilsack, uh, former Homeland Security Advisor Kenneth uh, Weinstein, and of course, uh, Senator Daschle, uh, someone who uh, needs no introduction. Uh, I will say uh, it is a pleasure to be serving in the House majority in the United States Congress, which is something that you are uh, no doubt familiar with from your years as majority leader in the United States Senate. And I think there's a real opportunity uh, in the Congress to actually accomplish uh, some of what this commission uh, is uh, seeking to, uh, to put forward in terms of policy. Food and agriculture are ingrained in every part of our society. Agriculture is central to American culture, economy, and well-being, and is one of the largest sectors of the U.S. economy. Protecting this critical infrastructure sector is incredibly important to our national security. Uh, as uh, I, I no doubt uh, know that you know, uh, Senator Daschle, one of the top three industries in Colorado, agriculture provides over $40 billion to the state economy and employs more than 170,000 people across the state. I'm honored to represent the epicenter of agriculture and agro-defense research and resources that we have here in Fort Collins. Fort Collins is home to the USDA's Agriculture Genetic Resources Preservation Research Program, which uh, I was lucky enough to visit and tour just a few months ago. This facility uh, studies and preserves countless seeds from literally around the world. Preservation critical not just should the need for biodefense arise, but also to the sustainment of our agriculture diversity overall. I'm also proud that the USDA National Wildlife Research Center and the USDA Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health are located in Fort Collins and are on the front lines of issue management and research to protect U.S. farmers and ranchers. 
Uh, obviously, here at Colorado State, the university is a member of the Coalition for Epi Response Engagement and Science, which leverages the strengths and assets of not only CSU, but five other universities across the nation to tackle these incredibly complex issues. All a very long-winded way of saying that, uh, as you can imagine and certainly as you can tell, we're very proud of the work that Colorado State University is doing in this regard, and it's an honor for us to be able to host the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense today. Uh, as the subject of today's event suggests, this is, quote, too great a thing to leave undone. Food security is intertwined with our national security. It unites all of us and is an issue that we can work on in a bipartisan matter. No matter your party, you care about keeping food on the table and keeping our families healthy and safe. The agriculture industry has experienced significant loss and economic consequences from infectious disease outbreaks in animals and plants caused by a variety of different pathogens. Although awareness and planning to approve response to infectious disease outbreaks has increased, many gaps remain. We must have the means to rapidly recognize and control an outbreak, which is, of course, why the Bipartisan Commission's work is so important in this regard. The recent outbreak, just by way of example, of African swine fever in China and the surrounding reason, re, uh, region, excuse me, and the response to this crisis is a reminder that we have much to do to strengthen the U.S. response to diseases that threaten our agriculture base nationally and globally. As a Congress, in my view, we must prioritize policy initiatives that promote and safeguard agriculture. I'm grateful to have the resources of Colorado State University and, of course, the, the Bipartisan Commission uh, to help guide our work in Congress and to help educate us as members of Congress in terms of what steps we can take. Earlier this year, as you know, Congress passed legislation initially considered by the House Judiciary Committee, of which I have the honor of serving on, that updated the list of biological agents and toxins covered by criminal prohibitions in federal statute. The Effective Prosecution of Possession of Biological Toxins and Agents Act of 2019 will revise the criminal prohibition on the shipment, transport, possession, and receipt of biological agents as well as toxins. Additionally, we made strong efforts in the fiscal year 2020 funding bill uh, to invest in a variety of different priorities to be relevant to biodefense. The House, by way of example, appropriated $735 million for Project BioShield, which will aid in accelerating the research, development, and availability of effective medical products to respond to an attack using chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear agents. I would be remiss if I didn't underscore that uh, the funding uh, six, the funding successes that we've had, not just the one I mentioned but many others, uh, are all the more reason why uh, we want to move forward with an actual omnibus funding bill in the government and not uh, CRs uh, as we have been uh, uh, more, akin, more uh, frequently doing uh, these days. Uh, we also are working to implement the 2018 Farm Bill that invests a combined $300 million in three animal pest and disease prevention and mitigation programs over 10 years. The three programs include the National Animal Health Laboratory Network, the new National Animal Vaccine and Veterinary Countermeasures Bank, and the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program that will build and fund partnership projects between USDA and stakeholders, including states, universities, and parts of the private sector to prevent introduction and spread of animal diseases. Uh, I suspect several other witnesses have gone into greater detail regarding the, the successes in the 2018 Farm Bill with respect to biodefense, and so I'll, I will let them speak for themselves. Uh, I commend this commission's call on Congress to commit to a more realistic funding plan for federal wildlife surveillance efforts in particular, and facilitate increased data collection from livestock and wildlife populations, something uh, that we uh, are in need of here in the 2nd Congressional District. And I am proud that the House of Representatives' budget included nearly $300 million for biodiversity preservation and over $100 million for wildlife trafficking. Both of these funding streams will take place on an international scale, ensuring our investment will promote partnership on a global level and grow global cooperation, all of which will lead to a stronger national security for the United States. And I will certainly continue to advocate uh, for those uh, funding appropriations to survive uh, the, the conference uh, that undoubtedly is, uh, will continue between the Senate and the House. Uh, I will also just mention that I'm leading two bills in Congress to invest in regenerative agriculture practices to both promote carbon sequestration efforts and to defend our farms and agriculture uh, from the biggest threat our nation is facing today, in my view, which is the existential threat of climate change. Uh, both of those bills, I will say, are bipartisan efforts uh, that will help to mitigate the impact. Uh, without going into greater detail, the, uh, the study on improving land soil act will fund funds to study, study soil health 
um, by way of example, by directing National Academies of Science to study the state of soil health on public lands. Um, and the Sustainable Agriculture Research Act would develop agriculture technologies that address the impact of climate change on crop production and expand the potential for long-term carbon storage through agriculture. But if I could leave the Commission with one perhaps the most salient note from those two bills, it is that, uh, as I said in the very beginning in prefacing them, they are bar bipartisan bills, and it's critical uh, that we find new ways to drive consensus on some of these existential threats that the country faces, uh, which is something that our office is certainly working hard uh, in that regard. At the state level, at the local level, there's also much that is being done to contribute to the protection of agriculture and biological contributions to the nation's economy and security. I'm proud that CSU and the larger Fort Collins community are leading in a number of areas that lend themselves to critical responses required within biodefense. Uh, the CDC, Division of Vector-Borne Illnesses in Fort Collins, uh, not too far from here, is a key player in detecting and, and treating disease. I had an opportunity to visit with folks uh, at the facility earlier this year and was just deeply impressed impressed uh, by their uh, work ethic, the integrity they bring to their jobs. And uh, as you know, this facility handles diseases spread uh, by fleas, ticks, and other creatures. Uh, and the work that's being done in this state-of-the-art facility with respect to animal-borne diseases, it really makes uh, those individuals, uh, those experts, in my view, an indispensable partner in these conversations. And I certainly want to applaud their efforts as well, as well as the many folks who are gathered here behind me. Uh, who I uh, am sure will partner uh, with these experts that I mentioned in terms of advancing efforts for collection of animal, human, and health data. There are a great many ways which Congress and state and local governments not only can but must seek public-private partnerships to protect agriculture and combat biological threats to our national security, which is the, the note I'd like to uh, end on before proceeding to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, from partnering with lo our local farmers and ranchers to engaging businesses throughout our communities, in Larimer County in particular, in conversations on prevention and identification of biological threats, uh, it cannot be our governments alone leading on these issues. While these partnerships uh, could be uh, quite expansive, I look forward in particular to finding ways to incorporate our thriving technology sector, both here in Fort Collins as well as in Boulder, with our tried and trustworthy agriculture communities to advance ideas that will not only promote biodefense, but will spark innovation uh, that ultimately moves our entire nation forward. Successful national biodefense, uh, you know, without sounding as though I am beating a dead horse or belaboring the point, but it will require collaboration across party lines. It requires leadership, it requires prioritization, coordination, and innovation, which is why I'm so grateful that we have so many bright, bright, room, uh, excuse me, bright minds in this room uh, leading this fight, and of course, with your leadership, uh, Senator Daschle. So with that, I thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Congressman Aguz, for a powerful statement. I appreciate your eloquence and your, your passion. We've used that word quite a bit in the last 48 hours, passion. I felt it all day yesterday as I listened to the dynamic presentations we were given, and I heard it throughout the day, a passion around this mission, a passion around the aspirations we hold for a safer and more secure country, a passion around the need to find consensus and collaboration. And so I appreciate your passion and, uh, and your leadership. Uh, you articulated uh, well, I think, the commitment the House has made in, in, in this session of Congress to addressing many of these challenges. And I would begin my questions by asking for your observations about that word you use quite a bit, bipartisanship. This is a polarized, confrontational environment we have now politically, unfortunately, far too polarized and far too divisive. And yet on this issue, there appears to be an opportunity for bipartisanship and a cooperative spirit uh, between parties and among leaders. What motivates members to overcome their normal concern for partisan, or their, their normal inclination for partisanship to, to come together? What was your experience with the bills you introduced? And how have you found the opportunities for bipartisanship on this agenda? Uh, well, it's a question that uh, I ask myself quite often, uh, and uh, I suspect many of my colleagues do the same. I've only been in Congress, as you know, uh, Senator Daschle, for about 11 months, so I'm certainly not a, uh, an expert 
uh, on uh, the uh, relationships within Congress and, and, and uh, the potential ways in which we could uh, solve the problem that I think you have effectively diagnosed, which is the growing polarization uh, that uh, is reflected not just in our Congress, but frankly in our broader society. And that, it strikes me, is something, having watched the political uh, process for a long time, notwithstanding only being in Congress for uh, the last 11 months, it has grown far worse and has been exacerbated by any number of factors that we could talk about at great length. My sense is twofold, that notwithstanding the polarized environment politically that we find ourselves living in, uh, most members of Congress are generally are trying to do the right thing by their constituents and ultimately are trying to represent their constituents as effectively as they can. Uh, we represent vastly different areas of the country. Uh, we all come from very different walks of life and we're going to bring uh, obviously those experiences and the experiences of our constituents to bear when we make these policy judgments in the Congress. Uh, but for the most part, uh, people actually are, uh, again, generally there are exceptions, trying to figure out ways in which we can work together uh, for the common good and ultimately promote the general public welfare. Uh, of course, those efforts are less likely to receive news coverage. Uh, it is not necessarily something you will read about on the front page of the newspaper. By way of example, our office, we've introduced, uh, I believe, 21 bills now, uh, the most, at least the last time we had checked, of any freshman lawmaker in the United States. And half of those bills are bipartisan bills, bills in which we've secured a Republican co-sponsor. Uh, we live in a time of divided government, and so for us, uh, it is uh, both uh, practical <laughs> in some respects, uh, and also, in, in our view, the right path forward, which is to say, in order to get anything done, we're you know, going to need to be able to attract bipartisan support on these bills. And uh, my sense is, on issues such as biodefense, where the threat is existential, uh, there is a greater reception amongst members to work in a bipartisan fashion, that those issues are less uh, amenable to being, you know, kind of, uh, to, to forcing people into their respective corners. And a good example of this is, as you know, there is a biodefense congressional caucus led by uh, uh, two distinguished colleagues of mine, uh, Representative Brooks, Republican member, and of course Representative Eshoo, uh, a, a Democratic member. And the fact that they have been able to partner on a bipartisan caucus uh, focused on biodefense, I would, I think, is something that uh, we all should find collectively very heartening. Of course, we'd like to see more of those efforts, and I do think amongst this freshman class of lawmakers in particular, uh, you, you are seeing more partnerships being developed across party lines. So uh, I hope that that uh, is a sign of things to come, but you know, obviously uh, we'll, you may have to ask me that same question a year or two from now if I continue to have the honor of serving. You also used a, a term that was referred to quite frequently throughout the day and that is the need for public-private partnerships. And obviously, you've had uh, limited experience in Congress, but I sense just from your articulate presentation and your, uh, the reputation you've already developed that uh, you can appreciate the importance of the private and the public sectors working together. I think land-grant universities probably reflect, in some ways, more capably than almost any other entity I know, the desire and the success around building public-private partnerships. If you had to advise policymakers on the ways with which to encourage greater public-private partnerships going forward, especially utilizing land-grant universities, what advice would you have for them? So I think you've, uh, you know, your articulation of the inherent benefits uh, that can be derived from effective public-private partnerships, uh, I think is very well said. And of course, land-grant universities, as, as you mentioned, are not new to this domain, because in some respects it is enmeshed sort of in the formative history of land-grant institutions like Colorado State University that have for over a century worked hand-in-hand -hand with farming communities and agriculture uh, communities to try to move the ball forward, so to speak, on a, a given policy issue, leveraging the ingenuity of uh, the American workforce, the local workforce here, the expertise of industry leaders, uh, while at the same time uh, doing it through uh, the, the, uh, the careful lens of policymaking. And from my perspective, I think one of the areas that Congress can ultimately play a leadership role, and 
uh, to some extent, uh, local and state uh, policymakers as well. So at the end of the day, I think Congress is going to have to step up to the plate uh, in terms of this question around public-private partnerships. And it's really on the research and development side. I mean, th there is visiting with both federal government workers, some of whom I mentioned, whether it's at the CDC or the various USDA installations here uh, in Fort Collins, and then, of course, visiting with uh, industry leaders as well um, who are doing some breathtaking work. It is clear uh, that if we were to invest a you know, Manhattan Project-style level of investment, and not just in biodefense, but in any number of other uh, areas as well, you know, ARPA-E and agriculture more broadly, that we could see technological advancements that would really change the game, so to speak, uh, both with respect to biodefense and a number of other important areas. I think about this a lot. Um, I know you have uh, children and grandchildren. Um, I have, my wife and I have one daughter uh, who's 14 months old. And so, so much of the work that I do in Congress now, uh, I see through the prism of being a young father and thinking about how different the world is today uh, with her being 14 months from when I was her age. Uh, and I, my sense is that at the end of the day for some of the sort of biggest obstacles from a biodefense perspective, as well as again other policy issues, the challenge will be can we leverage enough federal dollars to ultimately enable the incredible research uh, that's happening every day in federal labs uh, across the country and certainly in this district uh, to ultimately uh, reach some solutions to these problems. So that, in my view, would be one lever uh, that I would certainly recommend the federal government lean on. Um, uh, Congressman, uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of opinions from a lot of people today, uh, but I would be curious to hear from you, having come from Colorado and been in Colorado for quite some time, what you're concerned about, uh, what strikes you as uh, worrisome when it comes to the biological threat or the agricultural threat um, to, to Colorado itself? So it's a great question. Uh, and I guess I would say, from my perspective, and the reason why I pause is, you know, I, there are a number of threats that threaten our fundamental way of life. And to me, climate change is, is the existential threat um, ab above all other threats because it truly does represent an existential one and one in which if we do not solve the planetary crisis we find ourselves in, the world will look dramatically different for my daughter and her generation and, uh, and countless others. Biodefense, of course, you know, some of the most pronounced threats from a biodefense perspective uh, can also be connected to the broader threat of climate change. And so when I think about you know, the, the threats uh, posed in the biodefense space, I think of the challenge for farmers uh, here in our community, by way of example, dealing with inf new infectious uh, animal-borne diseases uh, that we've had never, you know, have, have never come across before and not are accustomed to and are a byproduct of the changing nature uh, of our planet, uh, which in turn is being caused by obviously the growing uh, carbon emissions day by day. And so I, to me, that represents, you know, without getting at the granular level of all of the various ways in which, from a biodefense perspective, uh, there is much at risk, I, I guess I, I, I am still stuck at that 5,000 feet level, which is to say if we don't, if we don't solve the existential threat of climate change, uh, much of the impacts, you know, from a biodefense perspective are clearly not going to go away and are going to be exacerbated over time. Thank you. Well, Congressman Nagos, you've been generous with your time and we thank you very much for coming today. You've perfectly capped what was a very uh, productive day, a very informative day. And uh, we wish you continued success. We thank you for your efforts and, and all of the work that, uh, that you've undertaken. And uh, we hope our paths continue to cross. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Daschle, for your service. And thank you to the commission. Appreciate it. This concludes our session for the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Let me again reiterate our sincere gratitude to first to Colorado State University for hosting us and for their hospitality and the extraordinary cooperation and uh, reception they've given us these past 48 hours. 
We thank each of those who have participated in the discussion today and we are grateful for their expert testimony and uh, their uh, articulate answers to our many questions. And, uh, and, and we thank you, those of you who came to, uh, to be a part of uh, our session today. Some of you have come from some distance. And I would reiterate again our thanks to our students, for those who, who uh, were able to come and, and spend some time with us throughout the day. It's been a good day, and we'll come back to Washington with uh, a better understanding of the many challenges we face and the many opportunities there are in building out from the land-grant university perspective a role for land-grant universities as we address this important challenge going forward. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.